cool chair, man. The yeah, gaming thanks, chair thanks, you got. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's me too, the, me too. that's a no brainer, you know. Like, if you want to yeah. take care of your body, I know, bro. I know it's um, super interesting. I've been sitting on. I don't. I'm not. I don't do it during podcasts, but when I'm eating um, lunch or bre- breakfast or dinner, or if I'm uh, working in the morning, because you know, I I wait. I woke up today around three thirty. Usually I'm waking up at like 3.30, 3.45. And wow. uh, then I do- So uh, early. Dude, dude, it's just normal now. It's like, it's just body wakes up. Sleep Automated. at eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight o'clock in bed. Perfecto. Um, and so then I woke up around 3, 3.30 something today. And um, I, I meditate for about half an hour. Anywhere from 20 minutes to 40 minutes. Just mood, depending on mood, how my body does. And then I come in this room to, uh, and then I have this stability ball. You know, these big balls, um, like I think it's called the Swiss ball or medicine ball, something like that. It's a big ball. You mean a full physio ball? Yeah, but you can bounce on it. You can sit on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Physio ball or Pilates ball, they sometimes call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I sit on that all day, basically. I don't sit on chairs. Except now. Only for... Only for podcast. Only for podcast. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a no brainer too. Yeah, yeah, uh, very yeah. good for your pelvic floor. Yes, yes, and in core engagement, you know, Fatih, the um, it's so interesting. Like, there's this concept of. I, so what I've realized is, when you become competent at stuff, you have a certain level of confidence, in which no matter what is happening in the environment you're going to stay to your what you believe, right? So, for example, at Digital Jungle, where I work, and with Marta, we, we work together, right? There, and we sit, uh, uh, you know, everyone else is there. It's a co-working space. So, her and I, we have our medicine ball that we also have there saved. Like, they, they save it for us. So, we don't sit on chairs even there. So, everyone else is sitting on chairs, but we're sitting on the ball. And <laughs> and and it's like weirdos, you guys. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it doesn't even seem like weirdos. To me, it seems like we're their parents, right? Like you know, parents <laughs> do the right thing, right? Parents yeah. do the right thing, children yeah. watch, and eventually they may do the right thing. Um so I almost it, it's it doesn't even feel weird. It's just like, oh, well, you're, we're just parents here. And uh helping uh, helping out the kids. <laughs> to learn but yeah all right uh, very parents, interesting what about the checklist check this is check this is done oh yeah, yeah. checklist is okay long long okay. done man long done you okay. got to have your own checklist. you're like a you're like a <laughs> captain pilots yeah actually you can be you have that capacity yeah. i think i know i know attention I know. to details yeah. i know man so fati uh just yesterday i had this discussion about um we were talking about inner gift and um, there's certain things we do which we feel we are like above the rest, right? Like we're like in the top 1%. And there's other things which we're good at, but we may not be gifted at, right? So this concept of having the capacity to do something, what? How do you how do you think about that? Like intelligence, Can you be a little bit more specific? Like, give me yeah. an example. Yeah, for sure. So, for example, um, when I was growing up, I always loved hanging out with my relatives, you know, guests who came over the house. I always talked to them. I was always friendly with people. So I've always had the capacity to have a conversation, right? Okay. Now, most people have that capacity, right? We can People can talk, right? By the way, there's a some kind of background noise. What is that? Some weird like sh- 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 call to call to prayer. Ah, it's Azan. It's Azan. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. That's so cool. That's <laughs> I'm so a awesome. Very, You're Turkey. Okay. Islamic neighborhood. Yeah. By the way, I just realized oh, I am on so cool, bro. Tw- yeah. Say we're under twenty p. Is it okay? Like, or I should increase? Yeah, my... it's fine. I I am the same. No, no, no. You're good. Oh, okay. I don't okay. think you can increase cool. that. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. good so back um, to capacity yeah so 
so so uh, so everyone has the capacity to have a conversation but very few people have the capacity to meaning being gifted at a conversation right being gifted at conversations means you listen you are very attentive and you are empathetic right or you can't have a gifted conversation that goes to you know, some universal place, which we don't even know. So to have a gifted conversation with someone, you have to have empathy, ability to listen, and paying attention, right? They're all similar to each other, but that, that's like a great conversation. Like you have to care about the other person. You have to care about the art of like having a connection with someone, right? A, a healthy communication is requiring that, yeah. Right. But then everyone has the capacity to have a conversation, but having a gifted conversation is, what is rare. Gifted conversation, please elaborate. Examples, right? Examples. Joe Rogan, his conversations are very gifted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Jordan Peterson, uh, Lex Friedman, mm -hmm. right? I'm not so sure about Jordan Peterson's conversation. The way he expresses his ideas are excellent, but I don't find, I'm not so fond of him in conversation. Sometimes ah. he doesn't listen at all. He just speaks. Ah, you're right. Some, uh, well, it depends sometimes because he's a clinical psychologist. Right. And when he's actually, I'm sure when he's with a client, he's listening very well. But sometimes, for example, uh, his podcast with Russell Brand. He's, he was with his daughter, they were host, hosting Russell Brand, and Russell yeah. Brand was not talking. It was Jordan Peterson. Really? Yeah, watch really? that aspect. Yeah. Fuck, man. He did that with Do uh, Richard Dawkins. You're right. Richard Dawkins, you know this guy, Selfish Gene. Yes. When they did a podcast together, Jordan was talking the whole time. But some podcasts is the op opposite. For example, Wim Hof, only ah. Wim Hof spe was speaking. Or I heard from my friend, he <laughs> recently hosted uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, and he was just completely silent. He was just listening. That's what I heard. I didn't watch the episode. Uh, uh, this is so cool, man. You, you're, you have a very good point. I just assumed... Because I am paying so much attention to Jordan Peterson that he's also paying attention to what he's not. Yeah, You're, try to have a conversation with him. <laughs> yeah, might be very different. We but will. Joe Rogan is excellent. We will. Joe Rogan yeah. is... I love him, you know? Yes, me too, man. Me too. What about Lex Friedman? Not familiar. I just heard the name. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Lex just did a podcast with Sam Harris. Okay. Four and a half hours. I finished it uh, last. I'm like 10 minutes left. Just 10 okay. minutes left. Yeah. Um, Lex also did a podcast with Kanye. Uh, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, he, he's uh, very much into Soviet history, you know, Ukraine, Russia war, um, uh -huh. evil, sh the shadow. Um, you see a right wing guy. I don't know, man. He doesn't take any sides. He doesn't okay. really take sides at all. all right. It's hard to know. It's hard to know. But um, yeah, man. So capacity to, for conversation, we we get that Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is amazing. Um, Lex Friedman is 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 good, I would say. And uh, Jordan Peterson, man, uh, you're right. He doesn't listen uh, a lot, and I've noticed that. So I'm I'm very happy you you. Uh, debated me on, on that and then and then there's and then my own uh, personal example i would say that i have the capacity to let's say play sports all sorts of sports but i don't have a gift like i don't have some inner gift of becoming like the best basketball player or the best this or the best that like i i don't feel it like because I've played it, right? Define define gift. Gift meaning becoming top 10 in the world. Top 10? 
top one of the top ten pe peoples persons. Yeah, yeah. Not not necessarily becoming, but being having the ability, having the ability to become. Potentially well, become in in my in my mind, it's like uh, we have this concept called talent and a skill. Talent is like something more similar right. to what you're describing with gift ideas. It's like there's a capacity, there's a potential. And this potential yeah. might be activated or not. That's a whole different subject, right? Like some people are gifted for music, but if they never practice music, that will just stay as a potential. And to be able to activate that potential, people need to learn certain skills. And some people are very good at certain skills, but they don't have the gifts, they don't have the talent. So uh -huh. the, it, they might have spent 10,000 hours, but somebody else who is in the same field with much less hours of practicing skills, because they have the gift or the talent, they can shine better. Is that somehow? Yep, yep, yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly like that. So the reason I brought this up is because one of the things I wanted to ask you about is David Data's concept of deep inner purpose. And... Um, I, I've started reading uh, Way of the Superior Man for the third time. Uh, read it twice before. Every few years I read it. And the reason I, I started reading it now is because, or you know, rereading it now, is because I uh, have felt the shame coming back a little bit in my, in my head. The shame and guilt stuff. Uh, shame of uh, having sexual desire for women. All right. And unhealthy because we, shame. again, unhealthy shame, unhealthy shame. Yeah. Unhealthy because we, shame. we want to separate uh, between a healthy shame and an unhealthy shame. What's it's the difference? Huge, it's very important. Um, so here's the thing. A healthy shame. Okay. So first of all, what is shame? I mean, before I, that, we need to talk about the concept of freedom, right? Like ideally we are free human beings. We are free to do whatever we want, right? We are free to accomplish any desire that we want unless we uh, interfere the freedom of somebody else. What do I okay. mean by that? For example, I want to freely express my sexuality. I want to express my nudity, for example. But if I walk on the street as a nude man, I'm interfering with somebody else's freedom of, freedom of choice of not to see a naked man on the street. So, and right. I get ashamed because of that. And that's a healthy shame because I'm respect, uh -huh. respecting the boundaries of other people. But if I'm at home alone and I'm ashamed of my nudity, that's unhealthy shame because uh, why the heck I should be ashamed of nobody else. I'm not disturbing anybody else. I'm alone with myself and I'm feeling shame or guilt. That's unhealthy. That needs to be purified, cleaned, healed, whatever. Got it. Right. Yeah. So in this case, it's unhealthy shame. Yeah. And um, I, I've, I have some tools to deal with this. I know, and uh, to, to not suppress it and not just like say, ah, it doesn't matter. Let me mask it with some other stuff. You know, I go into it. I feel it fully, and I see what's going on. I become aware of it. And one of the things in David's book, Way of the Superior Man, is uh, breathe and use the energy for your deep inner purpose. Like, this is basically the gist of what he talks about in the woman deepen chapter. Deepen your purpose. Deepen your purpose. That's what you said. Or her purpose. Or your purpose. Yeah. He's... Your uh, own. Mine. Mine. Okay. Mine. Yeah. Basically, his his uh, chapter on, uh, you know, being like lust, basically. He says, when you see a beautiful woman, uh, breathe deeply. Uh -huh. Feel that beauty and then use that energy that you just have that libido or whatever you want to call it to strengthen and 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 deepen and improve and strengthen your that purpose and act on it more and uh use that for good for the contribution to the world etc cetera, etc cetera. it's a kind of a sublimation it's sublim it's exactly sublimation. And you taught me so much sublimation stuff, man, uh, with the with the Anabanda and all the stuff you taught in the in me in the past and uh over the years. So 
what is your sort of take on uh, deep inner purpose and this concept of lust? I think the idea explains it pretty well. Like, um, an authentic masculine man who is conscious is, of course, considering his purpose and trying to deepen his purpose. So, I mean, it doesn't matter so much exactly what technique you use. You can just do it mentally, you know, like based on your life philosophy. You read Stoicism, you read Buddhism, you know, like, and you kind of um, learn how to handle this kind of lusty situations in a different way, or you use breathing, or you use Kundalini Yoga, like the Bandhas <clears throat> that I've been teaching you, or make a combination of them. Um, but I guess there is the main point. I think we men, we should not be suppressing the lust, right? A lot of guys, a lot of men do that. They yeah. just act like they don't have it. Yeah, They just sit on it, just suppress it, and then it lurks somehow in a different way, which is in a nasty way, because it's just suppressed. It's not processed. So when you follow the way that data suggests or I suggest or you find yourself, you're kind of processing. You're kind of working with it. You're subliming it. You're transforming that energy to a higher lust, perhaps. Like I like what Jordan Peterson says about uh, desires, for example, there's low desires or lower desires and higher desires. So I have a lower desire to have sex with as many women as I want, for example. And that's not serving. If that's not serving me, what can I do? I have two main options. One of them is to try to suppress it, try to cut it off, or to focus on higher value desires like oh okay there is this thing that is there but there is this amazing thing that's up there that's so amazing that's taking all my attention all my energy all my passion so i don't have to worry about this so much it's still there lurking somehow but for example like to 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 serve humanity to have a family to take care of my child you know like something at this higher desire so when I, in my day-to-day -day life, I need to make decisions, I make decisions based on the pulling from the higher desire and not something on trying to get away from the lower desire. Does it make sense? Yeah, it makes 100% sense. Um, is there a time when this switch happens? Because for me, before I met Marta, I basically had the higher desire the same as the lower desire. It was the same thing, right? It was just like doing pickup, you know, be, trying to become a Dan Bilzerian character, Hugh Hefner type character. And I made it my life's goal. It was more like a revenge thing, right? Like, oh, I got me I messed up in life, my, you know, culture, religion, blah, 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 suppress my sexuality, blah, 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 victim, victim mindset. And then it's like, now I'm going to like take revenge on them and I'm going to prove them wrong or prove myself wrong or like, you know, go out and, and do run amok in the world. Right. And then at a certain point, I uh, fell in love, basically. So it's like now I can't imagine a life that is not with family and children and grandchildren and all that. Right. Because now it's like, well, this is a beautiful life now. Now now I get like my parents' life or other people who are like settled and kind of, uh, you know, living. My brother, for example, has two kids, like living that life. So now I don't see another thing except that. But my brain still has the wiring for that, right? And that's probably going to stay there a long time. Sure. I'm assuming it's going to stay there my whole life. The whole life, right? Still, I'm a great grandparent, however long it yeah. goes. But I'm, I am, I feel that it's best to embrace it. Embrace it. Not, because see, Fati, when we do Udhyana Bandha and we do sublimation, we are under the impression that the 
the thing needs to be sublimated, right? It like needs to be somehow transformed, transmutated into something else. So you already are a little bit treating it as negative, like a little bit that you're like, ah, you know, you're not fully embracing because obviously if you fully embraced, I, I learned it from Jordan Peterson. He said, whatever craving you have, whatever temptation you have, take it to the limit. Go, go with it. Go, go. Let's see how, where it takes you. Right. So it's like, okay, uh, uh, cheat, you know, cheating on my wife. Okay. Well, let's say, let's say you, you, you go after some girl. Okay. You, you cheat. All right. Then what? All right. Now you can feel that after the cheating, the connection with your partner will be less. It might break. You might get caught. You might tell her and be honest. That girl might do something. You might feel regret. You might regret it for the rest of your life. There could be so many issues that could happen with the cheating. So now you keep that outcome in mind next time the craving happens. And you say, do I want to go there? So does uh, Jordan Peterson actually recommend you to go there actually, or just do it in the mind, you know, just visualize, imagine you're doing it. If you remember. He basically said from this very short, th they also had a, there's a lust, uh, a 10 minute video where Jordan is in the Exodus series. And he's sitting in the middle with all these old guys around and they're talking like there's an Israeli like rabbi guy. Then there's like the, um, uh, the, 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 the psychologist guy, you know, and, and there's a bunch of people. And, uh, the, one of the Israeli rabbi, a Jewish guy says, um, in Judaism, it's the act that matters, not the thought. <laughs> so you can lust and think and blah, 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 all you want. But as long as you don't act on it, you're good. And then he also mentioned that if you watched porn, that is a lesser evil than cheating. Rabbi says that or GBP says it? Both. Okay. Well, GBP didn't, J, 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 JP didn't say it. Rabbi said it and JP kind of like listened to him. Rabbi said it he, because he, he, he talked about a guy who was 10 years taking care of his Alzheimer's wife and he doesn't want to cheat on her. He wants to care for her, love for her, but he was watching porn as a sublimation or whatever you want to call it. Substitution, let's call it. <laughs> Substitution. Okay. So, um. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that, man? Like uh, lust and um, like, because for me, the the wiring is very strong, very, very strong, right? Because I literally was spending, I mean, that's why I came to Kiev. I went to different other cities, right? It's like, oh, hot girls, hot girls. Oh, I'm going to a okay. new city. Does it have hot girls? Oh, no, I'm not going to go, right? I declined a, a, a postdoc with Mike Merzenich, who's like the founder okay. of Neuroplasticity, in San Francisco, because this doesn't have hot girls. Like, no, it doesn't have hot girls. Forget about it. So okay. my life literally revolved around this this pickup it concept was, of was like yes. that. So it's like a Buddhist Buddhist concept of samsara, you know, like or samskara actually. Uh, you have this uh, like it's like your mind is like a garden, okay, and there could be all kind of different plants. There could be beneficial plants or harmful ones. So, and you might have nurtured the less so forth and so call it negative ideas, negative tendencies, and they are really deep into your garden. Even if you cut them, you know, like will come up after some time. But if you stop nurturing them, if you keep cleaning them, at some point they will be less and less powerful over you. They will uh, distract you less and less. So it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, like. And also imagine the volume and the time that you have been nurturing these thoughts and ideas for so long time. So it will take much or less the same amount of time, maybe a little bit lesser if you meditate really effectively, I guess, um, you will, your mind will be cleared from them. 
but you said something really interesting before that. You said that, um, you know, like when you do sublimation, you kind of label them as negative. Well, not necessarily. Sublimation is a very technical approach. Like it doesn't really care about how you label it. How you label it is another, uh, it comes from a different aspect of us, which is more about the mind. But the sublimation is just about energy, right? Mm. And I need to go a little bit deep into the yoga physiology here. Like we have the uh, chakra system, right? Like we have seven main chakras, seven energy centers that all have their different consciousnesses, their different level of consciousness they have. For example, the second chakra is all about sexuality, lust, it's all coming from the second chakra. The third chakra is more about willpower, um, honor, you know, like heroism and courage and stuff like that. The fourth chakra, the heart chakra is more about love, you know, like divine connections start happening there. Uh, it goes up. Like, the seventh one is basically meditative concept, uh, meditative consciousness and connection with God. So what we do in sublimation is we take the energy from the lower chakra, the sexual chakra, let's say, and we just flush it upwards. What it does is just, um, it reduces the amount of energy that can nurture these emotions. You know, what's an emotion? It's energy in motion, right? Energy in motion. So if I have lust, if I have jealousy, like all these kind of emotions have a certain level of energy behind them. So when you technically move the energy, there will be less energy to support those emotions and more energy to support more positive emotions coming from your higher chakras. Does it make sense somehow? So we, we also have seven bodies, according to yoga. Not many people know about it. But each of these seven chakras are having seven manifestations in seven bodies. Because it's really complicated there, but we want to keep it simple. Um, so, for example, one of these bodies is the emotional body. Another one is the mental body. And the mental body is higher in hierarchy. So if you can think well, you can regulate your emotions. And if you regulate your emotions, your pranic body, which is lower, will be also aligned well. And also we have a karmic body, which is even higher than the mental body. So sometimes we tend to have think in certain ways because that's what our karma suggests. And the karma can be coming from our past lives. You know, like some, sometimes, like some people have very, very uh, deep uh, samskaras, like these negative harmful plants in their garden which is coming from not just because of this life but also from past lives so these kind of people need to work even harder to purify their thoughts according to the buddhist approach you know so um when you say it is i label it as something negative and i shouldn't label it as negative i should embrace it you are working at the level of the mind and this quite strong, I would say. But I just want to uh, separate between the sublimation work and the mental work. They're different paths. They can be combined and they can be very helpful. But what Peterson suggests there, I think, I think is coming from a Jungian perspective and I love it very much. You know, like, do the shadow work. You know, face your demons. And this is not something in yoga so much or in Buddhism they talk about it, but it's coming from Jung and I love it very much. I'd like to integrate that as well. So, Fatih, based on your life, when you um, got in a serious relationship anytime and you wanted to be devoted to the girl, um, what practices did you do or how did you conceptualize the life before that because from our discussions in the past you've had many relationships and kind of you know sexual partners and different you know different cultures and ethnic groups and all that uh mashallah right and and just um how did you think about these concepts how are you aware of this what happened in your body how did you evolve in your thinking process as you went from Single to relationship. Single to relationship. Well, all right. Let me tell you a little bit of my story. You know, um, I had a very dissatisfactory 
relationship life and a sexual life in my 20s. Only when I was 30 years old, I discovered Tantra and I started having some sort of um, satisfaction. Okay. And then it led me, I was in this tantric environment in a tropical islands and there were a lot of options of shaktis, of women. And, and I had a lot of different experiences, with a lot of different women. I had polyamorous relationships, you know, multiple relationships at the same time, devoted relationships with work, which worked for a while, which didn't work after three months or, you know, it was a lot of experimentation for about five years, maybe even a little bit later after uh, I got back from the islands, from the tropical island. So, so in ret retrospective, when I looked back, I saw that uh, this crazy experiences was healing for me because I was able to um, get self-confidence, re-identify myself as a man, like what kind of man I am because I almost created a new brain, you know, like from the loser brain to a winner brain. So that was very healing. So, and at, at some point, like maybe that's something uh, Jordan Peterson was mentioning is that I went all the way, you know, like I went to the bottom of it, I would say. And then it, it gives you this kind of feeling like, ah, oh, I don't need to do that anymore. You know, like, I, I know what it is. I experience what it is and I'm relaxed about it. But I'll come back to the Buddhist approach and there's a little tiny sweet story between a master and a disciple <clears throat> that is that says something different from the previous conversation we had. Let me tell you the story. Uh, there is this Buddhist uh, master and his student is complaining because he's not reaching nirvana after so many years of diligent practice and then he goes to his master like, what's wrong you know like, why why is it not happening and the master says do you have a big desire that you haven't accomplished and he says yes what is it i always wanted to live in a big nice luxurious house like a castle okay he says and the next day he takes the student to a walk like they walk a couple of hours and then at some point in the nature there is a big, nice house standing alone, like a villa, like a castle. And he says, do you see this nice house over there? Yes, master, I see. You know what? That is now yours. And then in that moment, the student gets illuminated. He suddenly, maybe in that moment or the next day, he feels that his desire is accomplished. And then he relaxes and then he moves on. You know, so sometimes it's enough for us to really believe and in our, because in, in our dreams, we also do it, right? You know, like if a guy doesn't have sex for some time, he ejaculates in his dream, he has wet dream. You're like what is the subconscious mind manifesting? So you can relax about, it, you know, so sometimes you don't have to act, but we can just visualize and see where it's going. Um, and then it can help us to progress. Get over this this obstacle because that's what matters. Does it make sense what I'm telling? Yeah, big time, big time. So, what about our parents and other people who have one relationship? I mean, Elliot Hulse, for example, right? Like, yes, last year I uh, spoke to him in Florida, and uh, we had a meeting, <laughs> and and it was great. And he always told me like Farhan. Uh, when you know, whenever I see a woman, I look the other way. I I don't look at her, and uh, he was very serious about it. Extremely, you know, Catholic serious about it. And, That's great, um, right? And so he, because he's embracing, you know, Jesus and Christianity, he's like big time Catholicism, and uh, he has a c Catholic masculinity like his brand. You know, it's like a rebranding type thing. So, oh, really? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, Catholic masculinity, it's called. And so that per that type of person who knows, and and it's not just Elliot, it's other people too, who who know that there are women out there. There is the 
there's this concept of going out and, you know, picking up women at clubs and getting drunk and going to parties and having threesomes. And here in Tulum, there's like sex parties happening, right? They call the play party where it's just a bunch of people just uh, going at it, right? BDSM and whatnot. So it's like that temptation or whatever it's called, project, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that lust or blah, blah, that will not be experienced. Like the, the actual act of it will not be experienced by, by people like Elliot and, and like my dad or maybe your dad. Like they, they just kind of married a girl early and they did their career. They were like kind of lucky to get, you know, someone and have kids and now they're living life, right? But then we have an opportunity or at least it seems like an opportunity to uh, go and, and, you know, go to clubs and go out and, you know, do day game and all this stuff, right? All the, all the, the, the wiring that, that, that uh, gets inculcated in us in today's world, in the Western world, America, Canada, and, and, and everywhere, and even in, in the, the rest of the world. So how do we look at these two worlds? as the traditional family having kids very young, like my, uh, the guy who buys my YouTube ads, uh, media buyer, he's 36, I think. And his son is uh, 16, <laughs> right? Okay. Just the other day, yeah. he was like, yeah, man, I gotta get my son a car. He just turned 16. I'm like, wait, how old are you, bro? <laughs> it's like, cause he looks so young. It's like a, like a young kid. Very and he young has a father, sixteen-year-old, right? Yeah, huh? Very young father, like twenty years old. That's right. Like even my father was—he uh, was twenty-nine when I was born. I'm—he became a father when he was twenty-nine. Like this, yeah. um person that is extremely young as a father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I was my my dad was I think thirty-one, right? So. How do we how do we look at that? Because there are people like Dan Bilzerian and Hugh Hefner and other players and stuff who I met a bunch of them in Vegas myself when I was living there for a year. They spend their life not with family. And a lot of kids, me included, I used to look up to them. I don't anymore. But a lot of kids still look up to them. They see them as the epitome of masculinity, right? Oh, everyone, oh, I want to be like Dan Bilzerian, right? Maybe that's now less, but maybe it's more, right? Like, how do we, how do you, like, how do you see right and wrong between this? Well, first of all, right and wrong are completely subjective concepts. Every single individual who's watching this has to find what is right and wrong for himself. For somebody, maybe the way of Elliot Hulse is the right way. But if I have to vote, I would vote on Elliot Hulse and then Bizzini. I have to pronounce his surname. Um, you know, like because that guy is gonna be that guy is gonna be lonely and sad on his deathbed. Elliot will not. And that makes a huge difference. So we got to have the perspective, right? You know, like we always think usually perhaps because of the modern culture as well, we always look at what is in front of us, right? We don't think about the future so much. We don't think about what's going to happen in 10, 20, 30 years, what's going to happen at the end of my life. Right. So when it comes to family, family is a big asset in terms of old age happiness, right? So maybe right now, Dan is much more happy than Elliot, but Elliot will be much more happy than Dan 20, 30 years in the future because he's going to have grandchildren, right? So I guess this is where this concept of lower desire and higher desire compete with each other. If you want to satisfy your lower desires, go with Dan's way. If you want to um, satisfy your higher desires, then go with the Elliot way. But... Um, guys like you and me, we are somehow, we're in the middle, right? 
Like Dan has made this decision. Elliot has made his decision. We are like somewhere in the middle ground. Um, and I personally, I'm a very, very, very experimental person. I haven't met anybody else. Perhaps we are in the same league with you has been so experimental like myself, you know, and this is a kind of, um, like a disclaimer that guys listening to this should not follow my footsteps because I'm taking the risk for my own life. So what I'm doing is not the exact right thing to do. I'm just experimenting, man. I'm just want to see what's the results going to be like. So I experimented with this multiple relationships, like tantric relationships for five to 10 years. And then I got married and I had a kid. And of course, when you get married, you don't think about something like that. You need to find someone who is very, very, very satisfactory for you in all the concepts of life, you know, like sexually, emotionally, mentally, culturally, spiritually, you need to align your goals, you know, your uh, hobbies should be aligned. And I thought I made the right choice, but I realized I didn't. It was a failure. I'm divorced now and it's a big pain. So I'm not the right person to follow in that sense, but somebody maybe can learn from my mistakes. And we can perhaps discuss about this, Farhan, you know, like Please. what constitutes a good partner, but maybe a little bit yeah, later. You told like, me about this many times. You, 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 you yeah. taught me this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But at the moment, you know, we are talking about something really interesting. You know, because when I look at social media, like I see a lot of guys like into Dan Bazilian way and a yeah. lot of anti movements like tread guys, you know, like traditionalists. And I find them, I really like them. First of all, I really like this concept. Like, like I see these memes on internet, like there's Dan Bazilian with 10 women around her. This is not a stretch. And another guy with five kids and a wife, this is the real stretch, you know, like this is the real shit to do. Like it's really much more hard. And that's true. You know, try having a kid, just one kid and continue the marriage. It's a damn hard work. It's a like, some of us more, are more lucky to run it. For example, when I look at Ben Greenfield and his wife, you know, they are very good, very good relationship, but both of them, he and his wife, they had uh, problem-free, trauma-free childhoods. Ah. So they don't have a lot of issue to connect and to run the relationship. So they are peaceful, harmonious family. But I had a very difficult friend, uh, childhood and a teenager life. That makes it very, very hard for me to be uh, harmonious in a relationship, in a romantic relationship. So I have to do a lot of inner work, even to come to that terms, like, even in, even to get married, even if it didn't work. Perhaps if I wouldn't even do my inner work, I wouldn't even be a father. But of course, um, a divorce is not the best thing for a child, for our child. It's traumatizing for her. So the ideal scenario is to get married only when you're absolutely sure that your, this relationship is working. It's going to be working for the rest of your lives. You know, you, put, you need to put all in. And that's the meaning of marriage. And that's not fit for everybody. It's a major decision, especially if you're going to be a parent, because some people, like some of my friends, they get married and they say, no, no, we're not going to have a kid. Why marry? <laughs> okay. That's <laughs> their decision. But if you're going to have a child, if you're going to, going to become a, par a parent, oh man, it's like the, the major shift in your life. Like my life is separated before I, between before parenthood and after parenthood, everything becomes much more difficult. First of all, you know, everything becomes, it's like you're playing a computer game and you are playing on the normal difficulty level, you know, enemies keep coming, you're shooting them, whatever life has its challenges. And when you're a parent, everything is the same, but it's difficulty level is hard, you know, you know, like. Just to have a baby at home, you know, like she's crying at home at night, all night long. You can't have a good sleep. You know, like all your routines are getting messed up, especially the first three to nine months after birth, you know, and if you're not really a great team with your partner, you're going to mess up. And especially if you don't have support from an extended family, well, no, 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 no. her parents, your parents, especially her mother and your mother, 
if they don't come and help to support the situation, ah, it's, it can be like hell. Mm. You need to be able to um, manage that time after birth. She's going to have her, uh, what's it called? Um, post-birth trauma, let's say. Mm -hmm. Depression. Yeah, post-birth yeah. depression or something like that. Postpartum, you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Especially if she's not a young mother. If she's after 30s, it's going to be even more demanding on her. Um, so there are a lot of a lot of criteria to look into uh, to kind of um, evaluate before you make sure you're jumping into the marriage with a child in mind. So let's talk about these things if you want or the other subject because there are still things I wanted to say. I couldn't say it. Um, about this trad guys. Okay, let me say it. The trad guys. Yeah. So like they are like some of these ideas very popular on Instagram is like find a lover when you're in the high school. Don't have sex before marriage. Just find a partner and stay with her for the rest of your life. Have sex with only one partner and that's your wife or husband that you're going to have children for. I find this idea that it wouldn't work for everybody. Maybe again for Elliot Hulls, obviously it works. For Ben Greenfield, somehow it works. Okay. But for me, I knew that it wouldn't work because um, I needed this healing. I needed to get back to my self confidence. And also, uh, here's the tricky part. Um, some because some men they do it and they get divorced, right? This is also a short, this is re social reality. A lot of couples get married, and I have even clients like that. They get married when they're in their 20s, thinking that, okay, this is the right partner for me. They have two kids, and then after five, 10 years, they realize sex sucks. The sex is not even present. All right, some couples, they can still manage to continue a marriage happily without sex. There are people who do that. Sure. But that's that's why I'm telling... Yeah. Everybody is a unique. You need to find what works for you and what doesn't work for you. So those couples, they can do it. Um, but if you want to have a marriage with active sex life, you need to first understand who you are as a sexual being. You need to understand what do you enjoy in sex? What kind of sex is good for you? And what kind of a woman you need to have in your life to satisfy those sexual desires? If you don't know these things, and if you jump into a marriage, after some time you realize, oh, this is not what I wanted at all. And then divorce, you know? So that's why I think for some guys, I, I think especially for guys like you and me, we need to have a lot of sexual experience before having sex. It doesn't have to be tens of different women. It could be maybe three to five or 10 women. If you're conscious, if you're aware, you understand that, okay, so this is what I what my needs are in sex. And she is the one that can provide me this. Okay, I don't need to experiment more. I decide for her. Let's go forever, you know? Um, but if you don't go through this process, it, there's a higher tendency to make a mistake. That's why I think Tantra can help uh, a lot because in Tantra, uh, we, we become, first of all, very conscious about our own sexuality. Tantra starts with your own relationship with yourself first to understand what your needs are, what what are your preferences in sexuality, what kind of a sexual man you are, and what kind of. Therefore, when you're conscious about yourself and your needs and your desires, you'll be more conscious when you're in a relationship. So, it's all about mm. conscious relating. Got and it. And then you can kind of purify some of these samskaras from your mind. So you accomplish some of the desires in reality, some of them in dream, like in fantasy. Because sometimes even just to imagine that you're doing something is healing, as I said. And in some of the Tantra workshops, we actually do it. Uh, we actually act out our shadow selves, you know? And like in a room with 30, 40 people, we don't have orgy, we don't have actual sex, but we act like, we mind like doing it. But just the feeling that you just kind of... Um, play that role 
is satisfactory, it's healing for you. And then you do a lot of meditation after that, right after that. And then you kind of let go of that. Okay, I don't have to do this. I, I just like that Buddhist guy, you know, like the student. So um, something can help in these ways. And then you can have a lot of experience and then make the right choice and stick with that choice. So some Tantra doesn't recommend you to be like Dan Bazil, you know. You can still have, like, it's like a middle way. It's not the alien's way. It's not Dan's way. It's like Tantric way. You can have conscious uh, experiences and conscious uh, relationship and that it will help you for a successful marriage. I hope it will. This is at least my goal in my life. Yeah. Fatih, what do you what do you say to men who are married with kids who watch porn? I mean, okay, let's go back to my story a little bit. So I had a kid. We were married. We are married. And I wasn't thinking about porn. I wasn't thinking about other women at all for a certain amount of time. If the sex is good, why should I? Right? If the connection is healthy and satisfactory, why would I? And so, so and if, all all the all the layers were fulfilled. You know how you said intellectual, spiritual, emotional, physical. I thought they did. But some of the things I rushed a little bit. I and see. Over the time I realized that they were not really there, but I was like projecting that they were there. Aha. Uh -huh. But some of the things they were present were also lost after childbirth really yes this is something you need to be really aware of why is that why is that um couple of things like first of all for a mother to give birth is not something easy and some mothers after birth they cannot recover their sexual um routines they can they need a break they don't want to have sex for a while and you also will have a lot of prolactin in your body. Right. Sure. Because huge increase, even, huge increase. Yeah. Even when you're, when your partner is pregnant, it starts coming up. So, so your testosterone levels will be lower too. So you maybe will not like to have sex as well as often as before. On top of that, sleep, sleep deprivation comes in. Ah, uh, of course. On top of that, exhaustion comes in, you know? Right. This, if you... Uh, I'm going through this amazing course of Jordan Peterson, by the way. The understand myself five big personality traits. Yeah, I did, <laughs> I did it. Ah, you did so, I did it too. I did it. Especially if neuroticism is high, you know, if both partners have high in neuroticism, yeah, there there will be a lot of uh, friction, there will be a lot of fights. So, and then it's like a test for the relationship. By the way, every couple go through this. I like to I've, my I've friends. Had I've had her do the the uh, four the sixteen personalities test. Uh, we've okay. both done that, and I know Jordan says uh, you want a partner who has one letter difference, right? So, for example, I'm ENTP, she's ENFP. Well, this is right? another one. model for our, It's another one. A, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, yeah. I know, I know, I know. It's another. Oh, you know. I'm just saying. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm I not very know. familiar with that model. It's the Jungian personality type test right i'm not very familiar right. with that the five personalities i did uh i think uh three three or four months ago and uh yeah i took the whole test and neuroticism was low quite low in both of you i mean for you it's she, low. she hasn't done that she, she hasn't done it i have to ah. I have to get her to do it i just wrote this down i'm gonna i'm gonna have her do it asap and Take then you test. can combine actually and have a combined report precisely yeah. So tell me so, about your your test. What was your, what were your test results? I'm curious to know. So have you done it? Finished the test yet already? Yes, yes. I can't remember. Like I don't remember all of the results. Highlights. But my neuro yeah, yeah. My politeness was zero. If I'm in the same like with some 100 persons in the room, I am the least uh, polite person. Right. And so disagree second, disagreeable, you mean? Disagreeableness? No, Osai? that's another trick. Disagreeableness also is 2%, which means that there's only one person that is less agreeable than me in the room, that 100 people. So, so, you're, so you're, you're, you're high on disagreeableness or agreeableness? I'm high on disagreeableness. I'm okay, 
I'm very disagreeable person. Very. Right. Right. But I'm even less polite than that. Ah. Got. It. Actually, uh, they say uh, less polite people can be very good comedians because they can be very honest. You know, like just tell the truth. Of course. <laughs> Of course, of course, and of course. My neuroticism was also high, and which uh, you know, like, makes a lot of sense. I need to find a partner who is very low in neuroticism because Peterson says, you know, like, on the other four traits, you need to find it's it's good for you to find a lot of match. You know, if you're both extroverted, it's good. If you're both um, conscientious, this is high, it's good. But sure. if you're both high in neuroticism, it's not good. So one of them at least needs to be really low to balance wow. the relationship. Yeah, if both of them are high in neuroticism, and my ex-wife probably was also high in neuroticism, uh, you know, it's like petrol and fire together, you know, like, it's not wow. very good. That's a great, great point. Going back yeah. to um, childhood, you mentioned trauma, and I'm reading, uh, mm -hmm. almost done with uh, Paul Conti's book, Trauma, The Hidden Epidemic. And uh, he has been on several podcasts, uh, Andrew Huberman, Lex Friedman, and um, he also treated Lady Gaga and Kim Kardashian and other people, celebrity type uh, uh, therapist. And uh, he wrote, writes about certain stories in this book. And a lot of the book is about childhood trauma and uh, what to do about it, what actions to take, what antidotes there are. So Fatih, from your life, um, and I'm obviously going through my trauma work as well nowadays, and I have been for a while. What traumas, um, however much you want to get into them, did you experience and uh, how did that end up basically guiding your life? Well, funny enough, like it was just, I think last night, I used this YouTube video about drummer of Def Leppard, um, the British rock band. He oh, wow. lost his left arm in a traffic accident when he was in his 20s, but he kept drumming and he find out some different method to be able to keep drumming. And he's a great drummer still. He's touring with the band. Wow. And it's really, it was a touching interview. And uh, he's a really interesting person. Actually, at the end of the interview, journalist asks, you know, like, if you would consider this accident that resulted with your lost arm, do you think you would, want not to have this in your life and he's like he's very emotional of course he's like i think it helped me to grow so much that i wouldn't say otherwise you know like I, i'm okay with that you know like because it was a tremendous uh boost for my life you know like it's a big trauma of course so it's all about how we deal with the trauma right and when you ask this question to me well, I'm still struggling too, you know, like, um, when I was a kid, when I was three or four years old, I had this social trauma. Like I had almost no friends in the neighborhood. There were a lot of children and I would be excluded all the time and big time. And even, I think I had some, um, like, well, how do you call it? Like I was pushed. I was beaten up a little bullied, bit. Bullied, bullied, bullied a lot. Yeah. Bullied a lot. It actually continued on to, uh, well into my teenager life too. You know, like we were moving a lot. We, I changed schools like four or five times. And in some of the environments, I was a good fit. I didn't have any issues. But then two years later, we would move to another school. And then there I would be bullied again. But I think it all starts in the, teen, uh, in the childhood, like early childhood, three or four years old. So my first memories were about social relationships was really traumatic. So it always resulted with me to have a lack of trust towards other people and lack of trust for society, which I worked a lot, actually. If I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today, probably. Fatih, what was the, what was the source of the bully? Some kids, like, for example, myself, when we moved to America, I was uh, lucky, fucking lucky, man, because I was in classes with all the all white white people, right? So it was like the gifted and talented group, right? The advanced classes and all that. So we only had like 20. Yeah, so we had like 20 people in the class uh, and I was the only brown kid. Everyone was white, but 
I didn't feel any racism because they were all like trying to get good grades like me. We were like the the, the good, you know, the, the, the high achiever kids. But my friends who had just immigrated, they had a hard time. And I had at least one, one, uh, I remember once a uh, uh, specific event of getting bullied, but I was bullied by my own people. <laughs> ah, that's interesting. Yeah, Pakistani youths like oh, wow. kicked my ass. Like four, uh, two brothers and two cousins, they kicked my, uh, they beat the shit out of me. That's uh, why you don't speak Pakistani accent in English? <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> they beat the accent also. Um, so I, I think I got really lucky that I wasn't like physically or overtly bullied. Maybe I was bullied like subconsciously. People said something. Maybe I ignored it. Maybe I suppressed it into my subconscious. I don't know. But for sure, I can't feel any moment where like someone came up to me and bullied. It, it was rare. Even if it did happen, it was rare. Maybe because my accent was already okay at the time. Maybe it's because I already spoke decent English when we came to Pakistan because I went to English school in Pakistan. Um, but yeah, man, I, I guess I got lucky. But for you, what was the source of the, the, the bully? Why you, they bully you? I never thought about it. Well, um, I have two answers for that. First of all, is more uh, logical. The other is a little bit more super superstitious. <laughs> the first one is that uh, my father was in the army. So this whole neighborhood, all the other kids, their parents were, their fathers were in the army as well. So I think maybe they were projected a lot of violence from their parents somehow. And it was a tough environment. And they, they didn't have a lot of compassion and mercy for other children. They were very tough. But actually, I need to tell you that I was also thinking and feeling traumatized from my father's side. Because I would be bullied in the street. I would come home crying. And my father would be angry as, why are you getting beaten? That's no good. Yeah, you know, like, I wanted to have some support and feeling of safety at home. And at home, I don't feel that. So it's even double traumatizing, you know? Father my issues. God. Yeah. My very God, important. man. So that happened for, from when you were like, Elementary school, first or no, second no, 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 grade? No. no, no, no. Three years old to four years old. Wow. Before school yeah. started. Yeah. I mean, like when, when we were five, we moved to the situation change. Where so for two years, everything was sweet. You know, that was not a problem. Yeah. And then when I was seven, everything was okay. Eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Like these years were fine. But three and four, those two years were... But... You are quite young, right? It goes very deep in your psyche. And then when I was like at the secondary school around 12, 13 years old, I started getting bullied again. Like it was a not completely different uh, city, school. And I was just becoming a teenager. And the boys around me were also getting high on testosterone. So I was getting bu bullied there <laughs> quite a lot. So I uh, don't want to blame testosterone, but <laughs> that's just an explanation. Maybe I'm scientifically incorrect we should blame we should blame sometimes we should blame testosterone it's okay to blame it i mean it's when we come to that point i would say there is like as in the book king warrior magician and lover the authors write in the introduction there is a mature masculinity and there's immature masculinity so the problem is immature masculinity not a mature version of it so like same for femininity, I guess. Um, so my super superstitious explanation for this bullying is I had this really interesting, um, I know you're not so much into it, but very interesting esoteric kind of reading from India. And it's the most accurate astrological reading that I ever had in my life. It's not even astrological. They don't even ask you wow. a date of birth. And... It was mentioned that two lifetimes ago, I was a very good doctor, like a medical person, medical expert. And then towards the end of my life, I started abusing people, like really abusing this power. 
and people had a lot of negative emotions towards me. And I guess that's also the reason why I had not just this bullying in my childhood, but also very bad health all my life, especially when I was a kid. Uh, believe me, the health problems was probably overwhelming than this bullying because I was getting sick every winter and um, getting antibiotics every winter until I was 18 years old. I think it happened every winter and I it messed up my gut flora. And it even, I think it created this um, slight autism in me or dyslexia, you know, tension deficiency, you know, like things like that. My nervous system is very sensitive. So I need to really maintain it, take really good care of it. My whole, whole body and my whole health, actually. If I do a little bit, if I start losing something, like I become very easily agitated and uh, it's very easy for me to lose my nerve. So, gotcha. yeah. What does, um, I want to know, because uh, yeah, you're right. I, I don't, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't even say esoteric because I, obviously esoteric is a very broad term and it could mean so many different things. And I mean, I come from an esoteric faith, so I was brought up in esotericism, right? Like as an Ismaili, which is like a Sufi type of sect, um, we were trained in meditation since we were kids. So like the, you know, for example, Ramadan, we don't follow it, right? We, we don't fast because Ramadan is exoteric. So for example, <laughs> when I was growing up, uh, no one fasted. I mean, we're Muslim, but we don't fast. However, uh, our family in Pakistan, they fast. Why? Because they will get uh, bullied if they don't fast, right? It's like a, it's, it's very- uh, uh, Social pressure. Type, a lot. A lot of social pressure there. So like my when my parents were in Pakistan, they fasted. Or at least they like pretended to fast and you know. Um uh, uh so e esoteric wise, for sure, I it's a big part of my life. But I wanted to know what um what does the like you know, past lives and th this this th this concept of Hinduism and and Indian tradition, what does it say about thoughts, right? Sure. Thoughts. Because Sam Harris has this belief, you know, obviously Sam has done psychedelics. He's done, uh, uh, he, he has a meditation app. He has done many Vipassana meditation retreats, uh, so on and so forth, right? He's a neuroscientist, well-read, all that. And uh, he has a family, you know, kids and whatnot. So Sam's conception of thoughts is that they are not ours. They don't come from us. They come from somewhere we don't know. Where the thoughts come from, we don't know. And Eckhart Tolle has a similar conception, right? Like, hey, power of now, present moment is all that matters. When you're in the present moment, when you meditate, this is all there is. You know, it's the, 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 uh, between the, 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 between the words, right? The, the space between the words or the, the space between the thoughts is, is what is mm -hmm. the present moment. So, um, what is, I, I, I want to know your conception also. And I also want to know the Hinduism conception from the tradition of Hinduism and Buddhism. What is thought? Well, um, like I like, I like this metaphor, which says, our brain is like a radio receiver, right? So it's just getting the transmission from somewhere else. Where though? Which universal source. Okay. Like it's a good, so a good question. I don't, I haven't, I, I'm not so much expert in this. I haven't experienced this, but I'm just telling you the theory. Right. So, it's like Steven, Steven Pressfield talks about, uh, in the war of art. Uh, this thing about the universal consciousness and, and, you know, coming through you, you know, creativity comes through you. You have to let the creativity happen. You have to let it flow through you. That That's the Stephen Pressfield uh, conception of, um, of, and then in Islam, there's this concept of akalekul, right? The universal intellect, which I've read mm. many, many years ago. It's like, there's a universal intellect, there's a universal soul, 
And you know, all the philosophers of Islam, like Nasir Khosro and Tufsi, and they, they talked about these things. The universal intellect, which is, um, you know, it, there's a hierarchy from God, right? It's like God, and then there's the word, but the word and God are not connected because God is transcendent, right? It's transcendent, it's above human thought. And then the word, like, basically creates the universal intellect, the universal soul, and then the universal soul creates the world, this entire hierarchy in Islam, or at least in one part of Islamic philosophy. Um, but what is thought to you? Like, how have you felt about thought? So when a thought enters you, do you pay attention to it or you let it go? Well, it depends all about, about my consciousness. If I am conscious, I deal with the thoughts in a different way. If I'm unconscious, I can't deal with them at all. Actually, they just, they just rule my life. You know, addictions kick in, negativity kicks in, you know, laziness, uh, procrastination, you know, all the things that are not helping me and serving my highest purpose are just abundant in my mind. And it's really not easy to take a control of them, you know, like, I mean, lately I'm kind of more, uh, successful in that because I'm really in the last couple of months putting myself on a high, um, highway to my best self. So I cut off a lot of things. I'm changing my habits. I'm doing my best in every way, every minute of my day as much as possible. And it brings me more clarity of the mind. So I can meditate better and meditating is actually one of the, um, descriptions of meditation, actually of awareness is all about this. It's funny because in Turkish language, it makes much more sense. The, the way awareness is translated is, uh, something to do with being, um, uh, it's, it's untranslatable. Like, um, there is a difference. So there's a difference between you and the thing. And it's very funny. 99% of the people in Turkish language are not aware of this meaning. So when I'm teaching, I need to like do a phenomenology of the word, you know, like oh, deconstruct wow. the word and say, are you aware this means that? And that's about having a distance between the thing and the yours and yourself. So if I, if I have a distance between my thoughts and me, and if, if I can observe them, that's awareness. If I don't observe them, if I'm in the river of these thoughts and they're just ruling my life, I don't have the awareness. Are some thoughts more important than others? Do you have a list of questions there? <laughs> no, 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 no. They just, they just, they're coming to me. <laughs> okay, the cool. Universal uh -huh. intellect is throw, throwing them at me. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, yeah. You know, uh, um, uh, I, I wrote, so my, my protocol for podcasts since I started has always been the same. I, the night before, before I start, I, I, I read, uh, usually fiction at night, uh, before going to sleep. But before I start my fiction, if I have a podcast the next day, I write 15 questions down. Okay. Okay. And, and then I shut it. That's my preparation. And during the podcast, I always have, you know, I have it right here. You see Fati, 15 questions are here, right? And it's like, I have it in front of me, but I rarely look at it, rarely. Because okay. I know these 15 questions are here. I don't need to look at it. So that's, the, right. that's like my process of, of, of this. So yeah, questions, they just come to me, man. Okay, cool. Cool. Well, I would answer from a little bit of the yogic theoretical perspective again like um our chakras are in fact antennas and like radio receivers okay so it's seven main chakras seven main antennas that can transmit energy from seven main sources in the universe like think about wow. universe in seven layers right so um so here's what i can do as an individual I can, like, it's like this, you know, like if you have a radio transmitter, for example, you have a certain frequency lens, right? Middle range, long range, short range, yep, yep. FM, you know? So these are all, like, I only counted four of them. Let's say TV is a fit one. You know, like there are already 50 different frequency ranges 
that I just listed. And like, it's like, let's say these are, these are the first five chakras like, and find two Got more, it. it doesn't really matter. So what I, but even in those frequency ranges, what I can do is like to find the radio station that plays classical music that elevates my soul or find death metal station, which delevates my, I mean, some people like it, like I'm not against it, but let's say in Turkish culture, we have arabesque music, for example, it's very depressive, you know, uh, it's like victim consciousness all the time. So if you listen to that kind of, because th those thoughts are, you know, like coming to you from that level. So what I can, what you can do is to just shift the frequency within that limit. And if some frequency limits, ranges, you don't get anything. Like, especially in the higher chakras. So you can at least start to uh, empower that radio receiver, like give, send them some energy, like with sublimation or some other yoga practices or meditation. So that chakra somehow first gets activated to a certain level, and then you can, oh, there's this completely new high level of thoughts coming from here. You know, like, so we can attune our antennas to the universal sources and optimize them, or don't optimize them and just get the shit that everybody else is listening. So this is about the power of thoughts. So um, you can do it basically trying to be aware of your thoughts day-to-day -day life and say where's this thought coming from does it belong to me no just this is a technique that but can help could any thought belong yeah. to us well going down the rabbit hole so i would say uh like remember that samskara idea that i talked yeah. about in the Buddhist. so we have the seven bodies again like and on the mental level I wouldn't say we completely own them, but we are carrying those um, seeds of thoughts for so long time that almost feel like they are ours. It's very difficult to let go of this kind of thing. Because it's like um, you cut one root and then it's already seeded next next uh, part of the earth, you know, on the garden. So you need to work a lot of with diligence so that you get cleared. Because what have you? I don't know if you have done a ten days of vipassana retreat, but I have I've done a couple of times. You have one one How time. Was it? it was great, man. It was wonderful. Yeah. Hard. Yeah, hard for sure. Uh, did you have this kind of emptiness of the mind? Like you don't think anything, you know? Like, dude, did you have something? I, I remember the day it was done, and we were driving back from. Uh, it was in Quebec, so we we're driving back to Montreal or Ottawa. It was uh, Ottawa, and then I think I took a bus back. But anyway, um, the happiness and joy and peace I felt, and it was this deep letting go, and uh, it was so much peace. The connection and the intimate feeling with the universe was unbelievable. I still remember it, man. I still remember how happy I was to just talk to someone. Like, it was bliss. It was bliss, man. It was hard, but it was great. For me, it was the opposite about talking to other people because I remember sitting on the 10th day. I was in uh, Kyoto, Japan. You know, like, uh, maybe one of the only foreigners there. And then the 10th day, they let you socialize right you can start talking but my mind was so resonating with so much frequency and when people come and started talking to me even just to hear the words was painful for me <laughs> wow i remember that yeah yeah but yeah so i need some days to integrate that but i remember that you know like you become your mind becomes so clear that you're like you're not thinking anything for a while and that's a bliss and then it helps you to realize that, you know, when you're not doing that, your mind is full of thoughts all the time. Osho has a very interesting metaphor to explain the situation. He's like, you're standing, you're using your leg muscles. When you don't need them, what you do? You sit down and you rest your leg muscles. Why don't you do the same with your mind? You're thinking. You don't need to think. Why do you keep thinking? <laughs> you know? It's like a conspiracy, you know, like we are always prone to thinking, you know, like 
we cannot just relax. Okay. And these thoughts are coming to us from the culture, from the um, environments. There are even like honest uh, conspiracy theories about this. In my really? back in my yoga school, yeah, they were uh, Romanian, like ex-Soviet, my teachers. Uh-huh. So maybe they had this tendency to think about like this, but maybe they were true. And one of the stories was that um, don't want to put down masons here, but the story was about masons. And in uh, capital city of Romania, this uh, masonry center, they had some really developed uh, persons with meditation. And when everybody's sleeping, they would wake up and they would emit these thoughts to the city. You know, like certain forms of thinking. So we are, whether you believe it or not, I think it's obvious that we are being brainwashed and mass almost every day, every minute of our lives. Yes. Social media, CNN news, you know, like there's a lot of brainwashing going on. So spiritual evolution is somehow also being able to break free from these patterns of the society and go rogue to some extent. Got it. What, um, what, are, what are your thoughts on synchronicity? So Carl Jung had this uh, concept. I think he was maybe the first one who like formula, form, formalized it and uh, conceptualized it. And I've had multiple events in my life where I thought of some person and they appeared. Literally, they appeared. And I was like, wait a minute. And then my scientific mind came. So, yeah, the probability is probably not so low for this. You know, you, know, you, you ask like a Neil deGrasse Tyson or, you know, these guys, they'll say yeah. stuff, stuff like that. Well, you know, the, you're living in a city. It's this small. You know, it's, the, like just the other day, I was having... Um, I was having a, a drink with uh, some some ju- I was drinking some uh, passion fruit juice, and the guy was drinking some cappuccino, and we were talking about the podcast. He's gonna come tomorrow. He's in a guest tomorrow, and he's from Montreal. He's a developer. You know, developed an affirmations app. Um, very spiritual guy, like re- really good guy. Very good story. And uh, I was talking to him about Rachel, because I had Rachel on the podcast just uh, the day before. When before we talked, uh, we're having our 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 coffee, and um, he was like, "Yeah, you know, uh, Rachel was here," and then blah blah blah, and literally thirty seconds later, Rachel appears, and I was like, "You see, this is this is Tulum. This is tu- this is Tulum. This is not this is not even surprising anymore." And these things have happened tens of times, right? They're like happening maybe thirty times. Like it has happened. A- yeah. I think they're happening more often to you compared to some other guys because, okay, honestly, not a rational explanation from my heart. I think because you're on the right track, because you're doing the right things, the universe is conspiring to help you, to support you. They bring the right persons to you. You don't waste time. You don't lose things, you know, because you're aligned with the universe, aligned with your higher purpose, your higher self, your deepest purpose, however you want to call it. But I think synchronicities ha- start happening more and more beneficially when you're on the right track. This is my belief, not a not a logical explanation. But they ha- they started happening to me quite often too. Like I had I can tell you spooky things as well from the last couple of weeks. Tell even today, even today, after you, I'm gonna have two strategy calls with two different clients, and their names is the same. And that's a rare name. I never, I never took somebody from that name. Like two of these guys, and this happened to me three weeks ago also. Like the same two guys with the same name, and it's a rare name in Turkish. We have a lot of different names. Ah, and okay. It was a month that ago. That makes sense. I, yeah, I was uh, watching this. I'm not so much into Hollywood, but somehow I just push myself to be aware of the what news, like what's going on normal world and I saw that one of the movies that were in the category of best movie was about Elvis I'm like "Uh, what they made a movie about Elvis that's great oh yeah just go to IMDB and I watch the trailer open the page and meanwhile my radio is playing I have uh, this rock radio and I'm just open the page about the movie Elvis and it starts playing calling Elvis from Dire Straits and I'm like, is this a joke? You know, like, <laughs> and things happen like this all the time. No, it's funny. 
Wow. So it's an antenna that is communicating with the universe. Because, you know, Fatih, for me, if I believe in Sam, who says thoughts are not ours, and I believe in, in Eckhart Tolle, life becomes quite fun. You know? Exactly. It's like, uh, I, I keep coming back to this uh, thing, and I, I want to ask you this as well. Like, what, what one thing would you want the world to remember you by? Curiosity, maybe. Love it. Love it. Yeah. I, I like that. I agree. I so super agree. Because letting go of thought, and if I believed that my thoughts are not mine, they're just not, they're just thoughts. They're not my thoughts. They're just thoughts. Then, man, things become so much easier. Because then I'm not attached to them. Like, this is not mine. We take ourselves too seriously. Like, one of the most famous uh, mantras or the method of self-investigation is to ask yourself this question. Who am I? Right. If my toes are not mine, then who am I? But a lot of people believe the thoughts are theirs. People don't believe yeah. a lot. May, dude, most people don't believe in chakras and universal intelligence. They don't believe yeah. in that. But they're like, okay, I am living here. And a lot of people nowadays are, are they're, they're self-proclaimed atheists, right? Like, okay, they, they, they say it and they're proud of it. A lot of other dude. people. Sorry, yeah. but I'm, I need to interrupt. Tell me. I'm a spiritual man. I'm aware of the chakras. I've been working on meditation for two decades. I, most of the time, I think what I'm thinking is mine. You know, it's not something to come exactly. out so easily. You know, it's like very strong brainwashing. It's very strong map of reality. We're living in the matrix. It's not a easy way to get out. It requires practice, diligence. I mean, also, there is also, there's one thing to experience something and it's another thing to come to that stage of living and make it stabilize. You know, like your experiences are there most of the time. It's something else. Uh, you can have a, like an experience, you have a peak, uh, like you, you can sneak into it. You're like, okay, oh, I know how this feels like, but it doesn't mean you're there all the time. So, I mean, the traditional spiritualists are not so incorrect by saying that it takes a lifetime. No, it's a hard work. In today's world of consumption, we also consume spirituality and meditate. Oh, I have this crazy ayahuasca experience and then sure. I found God, you know, like I also thought so at some point. And when I had my first LSD, I was like, oh, this is enlightenment. And the next day, no, I'm not so sure about that, you know. <laughs> so in Tulum, there's this tendency to seek out plant medicine, right? All the time. Either someone's on ayahuasca or someone's on mushrooms or bufo and uh, abig abigaine and uh, combo, combo and yeah, hundred percent like You're all married. the time, right? All the time. now, my uh, I've never done any of this stuff with a proper shaman, and I haven't right. And uh, I come from a perhaps I'm sure there's a childhood trauma associated with this, like everything else. But I come from a place where it's a drug which is um, like illegal, banned, whatever, and it's sort of uh, against my principles. This is how I've been trained as a, as a child, right? This is like for those bad kids do this. Now, my own personal experience, I've done mushrooms three times. Um, every uh, one time, every basically every time was like the actual mushrooms, right? And it was a, a high dose, uh, enough dose to go heroic. And um, I've done LSD once and uh, MDMA multiple times, weed obviously multiple times, ayahuasca once, but it was in a very shitty way. 
Uh, it was in Vegas. We were in a, a, we ordered it from eBay and cooked it in the kitchen. It was like a dumb way of doing it. I think you told me this story. I'm sure I told you. Yeah. And so I've had that, these experiences and I did every single one of my psychedelic experiences has, has been magic, like awesome, no bad trips. It's just been phenomenal every time. And I love it right now though, I'm in a state of mind, which is of the, of the, of the concept that without plant medicine is the way to be right? Maybe because I've not been called for it. I'm not ready for it. The spirit doesn't want me, whatever, right? But inside, I feel that if I can be in the present moment and the thought appears to do ayahuasca or this, it's just the thought. It's not me, right? It's not like my pure self is not that. Now, what, what's interesting about it is, is a couple of things. One, my friends who've done it, like my friends who've done DMT, and they've told me some insane stories about it, right? The, the 5H, 5OH, you know, the, the DMT where you like go out in the outer space, like the rocket ship, that type of thing. And um, all my friends who've done ayahuasca ha have had, like, they've had some wonderful experiences. But here's the thing. When I talk to them, I'm like, well, you're just this guy. Like, you're not flying or, you know, you're not uh, like able to go through walls. You cannot <laughs> read my mind. Like, you're, you're, you're like a, 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 a very fal you know, a fallible, imperfect being in front of me. You're not anything special. So who cares? Good point. Now, what is your take on it? All right, thanks for asking this question. Like, um, because recently I've been reevaluating my relationship with plant medicine very strongly as well. So it's kind of coincided. And before I go into it, I need to tell you that I, my first ever uh, plant medicine experience in ritualistic environment was around 10 years ago, nine and a half years ago. Okay. And since then I did a wow. lot, a lot, a lot. Recent. Yeah. Like that's recent, man. No, you mean 10 years? Yeah. <laughs> well, are you, you 10 mean? years old or 10 years ago? No, no. 10 years ago. That's was not my that's, first. That's, that's, that's recent, bro. I would have thought you did your first one, like when you were in your teens or your twenties. Um, my first LSD was, I don't call it plant medicine, LSD. Oh, I did don't. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Cause it's, it's, times... it's generated. It's made in a lab. Right. 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 Yeah. I mean, well, and I was like 28 ish, something like that. Okay. And okay. I did it only four times and I said, I'm never going to do this again. And I also did some ecstasy, uh, even before that. And I did only two and I, it was like hellish next day okay. a lot of the experiences for okay, me so that, was that wasn't for me very bad that wasn't for me i, I love yeah. both okay yeah but i always have this tendency for more natural things and lately in the last couple of years i'm really in love with uh psilocybin mushrooms ah uh, um uh, because i got this really really good quality one and i sometimes do it alone at home but here's my take on it so sure please um yeah i don't know where to even start like because I, I've sat with five to six or maybe seven different shamans, uh, air quotes, and some of them are my good friends. And with some of them, I was actually in the team. I was serving, helping, holding the space. And well, what, uh, what were the ceremonies, of, these seven? Ayahuasca, peyote, San Pedro, uh, and even something very similar to ayahuasca from uh middle east actually it's called uh syrian wow. rye in english wow. yeah like it has the same technicality with ayahuasca you know one plant having the mta another one having the uh and en enzyme blocking MOA. qualities so noa inhibitor yes yeah yeah, yeah. I, i'm not so much into the technical details but my friend was and i was actually like his um 
right wing, you know, like just holding the fire, holding the space, and he would lead the ceremony. So this is just one example. And wow. Yeah, I had a Chilean friend who was doing this, all these peyote ceremonies, and and recently, I had a breakup with both of these guys. You know. Oh, really? Like, all right, that's it. You know, like I'm not gonna, especially with one of them. The Chilean one is a, a little bit asshole, you know, character, and uh, you know, like uh, I I broke up with him four years ago, and then last year I came back. You know, like okay, like let's forget the past and let's. I started joining the ceremonies again and he was a much better guy and but lately he had a split with his other team and I was kind of favoring them because I know sometimes how unkind this person can be so he's Wait, a medicine man and that he's very sense. unkind that doesn't make sense right does it make sense like a no. doctor a doctor basically spiritually right is a doctor he's a medic um how can he be have a dichotomy between like a double life where he's unkind in one way. And this reminds me, remember in, in Kiev, we went to this um, big event. Um, your ex-wife was there, Sergei, like yeah. we're all there, La Dunia. And there was all these people. And then I was like, these people, like they're like Tantra people, but I don't get, yeah, yeah, we're hugging and all that. It was great, right? We're hugging each other and all that. But like the depth of empathy and uh i didn't i didn't feel that like mate I, I don't know i i i i would like to believe that i have a sense of that like i can sense when someone <laughs> is frauding around and someone is like really with you uh, somebody's authentic or not yeah does this happen a lot it happens in all medicine? the time man Okay. In medicine world, it, it it happens a lot. In tantra, it happens a lot. In any environment, if you go to a Sufi circle, you can find it as there as well. You know, it's a human psychology thing. Right? Some people, some people have really genuine self awareness, and they're really right. working on themselves. And some people are there just to uh, satisfy this feeling of to belong some group. It's ah. actually called psychology. You know, Jamie Wheel explains it very well about cult psychology. Every every social group is a cult. Every social group. You no, know, it doesn't have to be spiritual. Sure. Like sure, sure, the sure. Manchester United fans, the BMW lovers. Afro D Nation. Afro, Afro, <laughs> I was just going to say Afro D Nation. We all have, and this is part of the social reality. You can't just get rid of this. You know, like, so I'm very careful joining cults. And I'm usually like, okay, I'm here. I know I'm inside, but one of my foot is outside, you know, like I'm not fully involved. And I also accept that there will be dogma inside the cult because each cult has their own dogmas. Yeah. And, and leaders, you know, they're gurus but to worship. I do want to ask you something about cults, man. This has been kind of, uh, it's a very personal issue. I was in a, I wouldn't say depression, but I was in a very low, sad, um, introspective for about a month or two when I was in living in Playa del Carmen. This is um, last year around uh, Ju Ju June, June, July-ish last year. And this is exactly what happened. So I belong to the Ismaili faith, all right? And Ismailis are a branch of Islam in the, Sh in the Shia tradition, right? And in the Ismaili faith, we have an imam who is, you know, the present and living imam, direct descendant of Prophet Muhammad, and uh, we, you know, he's our spiritual leader, material leader, so on and so forth. And more Shia than Sunni? Not more Shia, fully Shia. Okay. Yeah, I don't think okay. there's like more Shia than Sunni. It's like what you are, one or the other. <laughs> Maybe, okay. I don't know. Uh, but it's it's a Shia, so in the Shia faith, there's Isnashris and, and, and Ismailis. And we are in the Ismaili faith because it's Imam Ismail. We followed from that. So the, the, what happened is during that time, this is right after, um, so we were in Ulis, uh, uh, you know, fixing my mom's health. And then we came to Playa to live there for three months. In Playa, I found, I was, I don't know why I f found this channel or I had some inside calling or something happened where I was like, you know what? I want to really 
see if this thing is BS or real? Like, is the imam a fraud? Basically, that was the question. That was a question that was bothering me for a while because as a kid, I went to Jamaat Khana every day. Jamaat Khana is a prayer hall. I knew all the prayers by heart, right? They would call me if like some guy didn't come. He's like, oh, Farhan knows it by heart. Just call him. He'll say, it, right? I was the model citizen of the of the prayer, of, of, the, of the faith, right? Um, I would, you know, count the money that they got, you know, from everyone and they would send it to the imams. I was one of the people who would count the money. So I was very, you know, trust, they trusted me. I was uh, basically on my way to becoming the leader of the community, right? Like not the imam, but like the local leader. And then what happened is I uh, had, you know, girl problems and sort of, uh, you know, ED and, you know, couldn't get it up in the bedroom, all that. So I basically told myself, I'm like, you know what? Fuck all this stuff. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to care about uh, spirituality, religion, uh, being a good person, blah, 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 because I'm good at all this already. Like, I'm already good at this, but I suck at this other thing, right? Confidence with women and like being able to talk to people and like, I suck at this shit. So, you know what? I'm going to stop praying. I literally consciously stopped praying because for probably, this was, uh, this was probably when I was like 30. 33, maybe 32-ish, because uh, I finished PhD at 31. So it was like around 32, 33-ish, right? Basically, since I was five or six years old, since I learned how to say the dua, which is our namaz you know, type thing, I had said it every day, three times a day, every day. I never missed a day, ever. I went physically to pray or I prayed at home if I couldn't go, no matter where I was in the world. Even if there was no Jamaat Khan, I prayed at home all the time, right? I was devoted to the Imam. I listened to all of his farmans, all of the this teachings, like I was devoted. And then in Playa last year, something happened. Maybe it was like the seven or eight years of being away from it and not praying. And, you know, my mom and dad, they're, they're like, you know, uh, my mom is different than my dad, but my mom, especially, she was always be like, beta, beta is like son you know, you should pray, you know, like all this cult stuff, right? And last year, I found a YouTube channel, this guy who used to be one of the big leaders in Australia of our faith. And he realized that it's all fraud. So he started a YouTube channel to talk about the proof of why it's fraud, why the prayers are said this way, what is the history behind this faith? What does the Imam do? Like for one of the examples he gave is, the Imam has a $200 million yacht. Why? Simple. Why? Why have it? I mean, Jesus didn't have it, right? Like, why, why does he have it? And so these types of thoughts, right? Like, got me thinking. I'm like, huh, wow. I belong to a cult for like 30 years of my life. And I devoted so much time and energy to that. Yes, it developed my spiritual mind. It developed community. When I was at the Elliot Hulse retreats, I would see people in trance, men, because we were basically all men, maybe two women. And uh, I saw people in trance. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? Why are they in trance? And then I was like, oh, well, when I'm at the ceremonies, in, in, in our, our Jamaat Khana, in the prayer hall, I'm in a trance. I get in a trance, just like this guy. But this guy doesn't have any mom. I do. So I felt superior to him, right? I felt like I'm better than him because I have a community. I have a, 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 a belonging. I have something to look up to, you know, something for spirituality, for after death. He doesn't. So of course he's going to think Elliot Hulse is his God. I don't, right? So last year, literally, bro, a, 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 a stone, a big, big stone asteroid fell in, in my world and it like destroyed it because the entire 30 years of programming just because as I was watching this YouTube channel, I was also thinking, I was like, wait. I got brainwashed by doing this. And when I was a kid, 
they made me do this. And then in the prayers, we pray to this. And then in our dua, they changed this stuff from the Quran to say this. Interesting. And then the Imam has this $200 million yacht. Interesting. He asks all of us for money every day. Interesting. During COVID, when we couldn't give money, the, the, the local leaders called up people on the phone and had them PayPal money to, to them. Damn. <laughs> and my, all my family, most of my friends are still there. Shit. And what's interesting, Fatih, is that being away for like, what, 40, I was 40 when I discovered this last year. And uh, I was 32. So eight, eight years, seven, eight years of rewiring. You know how you say like it takes the same amount of time to rewire, you know, to unlearn and to learn, maybe even longer, unless you're like uh, really living your purpose or, or focusing. That this seven, eight years of being away from it, unlearned and rewired enough of my brain to look at it from a perspective of right now in the moment. As I'm talking to you in the moment, I don't have faith in, in, in this person or this, this cult. It's not part of my consciousness. God is not part of my consciousness. Like, you know, God the person in the sky. Uh, all these things are not in my consciousness. But what is it my consciousness is being? Like the fact that I am. And because of the fact that I am, you are. Because you are in my mind. Right? I, I am includes you are. Or, or there wouldn't be you without me. So, so that sort of became my, you can call it God, like potential, right? Potential. There doesn't I have know, to be a God. Right. I know this. I can feel this. I, I get this being that we are in, whatever the fuck it is, simulation or not. I see it, right? I feel it. And I know that I have a potential, right? There's this consciousness that I can feel, this awareness I can feel, this whatever state you want to call it. And I know there is a potential that I can feel what could be, right? What I could be. I know that pure joy, that enlightenment, that, that, that peace. I know I've touched it. Maybe if I've touched it even 1%, I, I kind of get it, right? Kind of get it. But everything else, God, religion, right? Uh, uh, prayers. It's not right now in the moment. So how could it be real? How could it not be fraud? Right? So from that moment, what my earth, my entire world got shattered last year, I became free, more free, man, more free. And I was like, wait a minute. I don't have to pay debt to this person or to feel guilty, bro. Every day we would uh, uh, go like this, and we would say, "Tobo tobo taksidar bando sir tapao gune gar yasha tu guna bakshi bakshan ha." And it means, "Tobo tobo taksidar." It means I seek forgiveness. Bando sir tapao gune gar means I am sinful from head to toe. Yasha tu guna bakshi bakshan har. Oh Imam, please forgive my sins and uh, give me blessings. Right? And I was like, kids say that. What sins? Well, yeah. I mean, I appreciate your um, liberation, but just want to say something. The fact that this cult didn't fit you doesn't necessarily mean that it's useless for the people who are in it. Because everybody has different levels of consciousness. Right now, you have a much higher consciousness than your previous self, and you have definitely higher consciousness than your relatives who are still within the cult. If they had the same consciousness with you, why would they stay in the cult, right? And it is childish. It is childlike for sure. 
Look, there's a very interesting story, I think, in the Quran about Prophet Moses. Uh, so, you know, Prophet Moses receives these revelations from God all the time, like God is talking to him all the time. Not all the time, but most of the time. And he's somehow getting initiated into the monogamous religion, so to say. And one day he's walking, walking somewhere, and he sees a shepherd. And the shepherd has a baby doll and praying to the baby doll, thinking that he's the God, you know? And you know what happens? Moses comes and tells him, what is this shit? This is not how to pray. This is not God. God is there, you know, like this. You need to pray like this. And he leaves. But what happens is the shepherd, he stops praying completely. Um. He gets hearts broken, right? Because he was thinking he was doing the right thing. And some dude comes in and he said what he was doing was wrong. And then Moses get this revelation that what the heck did you do? You messed up the life of this guy. He was at least praying. You see, so the cult is having a function, even though it can be very problematic. Um, I'm not, I used to be very um, against all kinds of cults, you know, like, but now, now I'm like, let people do what they want to do. Sure. You know, sure. maybe serving them, maybe it's serving some purpose. I mean, the community is unbelievable, man. The yeah, community is sure. unbelievable. And if it, believe me, Farad, if we destroy all the cults in the world, the world would be a really messy place. It would be much worse. So G you it. can't see the whole big picture. Because we're tribes, right? Sociologically, yeah. it's a very complicated world we are living in sociologically, you know? Now, Elliot Hulse, he has his own cult. Maybe he has his own dogmas, you know? Like, and But it should be like that because it helps some people. It does. Big time. That's why. R all, RSD, right? All, RSD, yeah. RSD cult. And yeah, I'm, yeah, coming, yeah. I'm coming from, like, I'm coming out of a lot of cults. I had a lot of, especially in 2018 was a really interesting year for me. Um, but anyway, um, let's get back to the plant medicine because Please. it's interesting. I mean, here's a, here's a story. Like, all around the globe, it's, it's a humanity reality. You know, like, we are individuals and we have this higher power, absolute truth, Great Spirit, God, Yahweh, Jesus, whatever you believe in, right? But we have, I mean, some of us are atheists, but then maybe we sure. tend to worship science, you know? Um, but we always want to believe in some greater force than who we are. And there are tons of different institutions, traditions, cultures that intermediate between the individual and this higher consciousness. Some of us can be like Krishnamurti, we can be completely like rogue and just do our own thing. But not everybody has the gift to do that. Right? So, um, and plant medicine is one of them. I mean, traditionally, when you look at the plant medicine culture, it's not a plant medicine culture. It's Native American church. It's the oh. Brazilian Yawanawa tribe that have been drinking ayahuasca yeah, I, I read about this tribe in uh, one of the books. I just read about this tribe. Yeah. They're fucking savage, man. Right? One it's like a crazy. Yeah. Yeah. One of, I mean, actually, one of the, the Turkish medicine family that I'm in touch with them, they are visiting this tribe all the time. They're in very good connection shit. right there. Yeah. I mean, there are other tribes too, you know? Like, um, like this is their way of living. So, we need to be at least first of all be aware of that this is not something you go and buy from a shop in amsterdam and try it at home or do it with a western so-called gringo shaman you know because right i mean in peru in brazil in you know also for other plants like peyote in northern america there are a lot of medicine men and medicine women who are leading these ceremonies and not all of them are uh, pure by the way like in Peru, especially, we have a lot of infamous shamans that are abusing people, raping women. Yeah, we have a lot of bad stories too. Indigenous people, indigenous people can do it too. So there's always this risk of abuse and uh, getting stuck with dogma because they're all uh, about cults. With the, with the shaman specifically, there is a theory among neuroscience books 
which I've read, that it's just someone with schizophrenia. Simple as that. So in the past, when someone saw things that other people didn't see, and they ended up being right. Like, for example, let's say a kid is about to be born, right? And uh, nobody knows that the kid is going to be born or, or even if they know, the shaman is like, oh my God, I imagined this kid uh, being dead when he was born, coming out dead, right? I imagined it. I imagined it. Now, if that kid is born dead by chance, then they will think that this schizophrenia person is a sham is is a is is like a prophet or whatever right he saw something that nobody else saw but if the kid comes out alive then that person is going to be wrong and then they're going to burn him or whatever hit him with stones whatever they do so traditionally societies who've had schizophrenia prone people schiz schizotypal people who are schizophrenic or just schizotypal, which is a different term, they are celebrated if they are right. If they are right and if they are right at the right time, they're celebrated, right? Like for example, a, sh a schizophrenia person is like, oh my God, I just saw rain. There's rain that's going to happen. And let's say drought has been there in that, in that uh, village for five months. And then the rain actually happens by chance, they're going to think he's a prophet. So do you come from this thing also, or do you actually believe that shamans have a spiritual, some metaphysical, you know, conscious power? I'm skeptical. I'm an experimenter. What do I mean by that? Some of them, they do have this accurate capacity. Some of them don't. And they're just charlatans. Like, um, I don't remember the exact results, but I was like, I've been into the spiritual world for 20 years now. Okay. And at some point I was in, uh, into very much into pyramids because there was this, um, uh, pyramids fold in Bosnia and it's very debated if they do exist or not, they're huge pyramids. And the guy who fought them, he was, he was a Bosnian scientist, archeologist. And he was actually working a lot in Mexico. He wrote a book about the Mayans before that. But the point is this, he, one of his books is about science of spirituality. So he, he ran an experiment. I don't unfortunately remember the details, but it was something like this. So he got in touch with 10, um, seers, right? 10 people who claim to have psychic powers, intuition, you know, and then he asks maybe seven or 10 questions to each of these 10 people and the results come in, right? Because it's something like this, like behind that door, there are how many shoes? Something like uh, that. I'm ESP, ESP, like ESP experiment. Yeah. Extrasensory perception. Yeah. 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 Something like that. So, and what happens is like, there is a truth, right? It's an observable truth and not 10 of these guys or people, they accurately describe the situation that is behind the doors. But some of them do, and some of them consistently do. Which brings us to the idea that, so, okay, so there's one black box and there's inside the box, there's some object. And 10 people, they claim what is inside. Okay. And if three of them, claim the same thing and these people don't have connection with each other of course scientifically it's measured and they all claim the same thing and that is the true thing these three people are genuinely having ESP and the seven other people are bullshitting right so there are ways if you want to bring the scientific methodology there are ways to experiment with these ideas but unfortunately in the scientific world most of the time they're either ignored or dumped, you know, like, I don't want to go there. But some people start doing that. And I think it's very precious. When it comes to your question about me believing shamans, if they are not or do, I mean, for example, the guy that I was referring before, he's not saying he's a shaman. He doesn't claim to have ESP. He just says he's a medicine man. He's helping people to recover their traumas, you know, psychological issues and open up to gods, have better experiences. And 
So let's talk about the elephant in the room, right? So does ayahuasca help people? What's the benefit of doing plant medicine? In all my honest um, opinion, I think if the person is not doing any kind of work outside of the plant medicine experiences, it's not going to be very helpful. We need to be doing certain type of inner work, like a disciplined work, like meditation, daily meditations, um, yoga practice, tantra practice, breath work, something that is at the core of our lives that will help us to evolve and to commune with God, you know, maybe it's prayers. And if you don't do any of them, you just go to a ceremony, have some amazing experience and come back to your life, it's not going to help you and it, it will potentially harm you. The, it's not true that there's no risk associated with this kind of experiences. First of all, um, if you take for granted the yogic worldview, we have astral realities. You know, we have physical realities, pranic realities, and karmic realities also, but in between we have astral realities. And there are a lot of astral entities that might want to abuse you. And when you take plant medicine, you open up to the astral world. And some of these beings are beneficial beings. They are, they're there to help you. Really, they're going to guide you. They are the light side of the force, so to call. But some of them are on the dark side. And they might want to possess you. They might want to hurt you. They might want to abuse you. They might, so you might get addicted to something, addicted to certain type of thinking, doing, acting. It's not a good sign. If you are addicted to something, probably this astral entity is connected with you and sucking your energy. It could be even tobacco, simple as tobacco, alcohol. Why on a bar we go and on the menu it says spirits? <laughs> Whiskey, gin, vodka, right? Even funny, gin, in Turkish, it means this uh, astral entity, gin. Yeah, in the Quran too, is the, the gin. Yeah. yeah. I know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, so alcohol, it could be tobacco, it could be marijuana, it could be, I don't know, sex, could be sure. porn, could be computer games. We all have a different type of, I mean, most of us have addictions. And if, uh, if the medicine man is addicted to something, could be even be tobacco, I'm going to be skeptical about that. And if he's unkind, if he's not empathetic, I'm going to be skeptical, skeptical about that. But the most importantly, I think, is that how much progress I'm having in my spiritual evolution with these plant medicines. Is it really helping me? Is it really healing me? Or is it just giving me an illusion of healing and mm -hmm. enlightenment? So... Everybody, we need to ask these questions. And of course, there is this aspect that most, most Western people completely ignore. That is, they're coming from a tradition too. Right. And this tradition is really beautiful when you look at it. They're very much connected with nature. Like, I really love Native American spirituality, you know, like they're connected with the great spirits. Everything in the nature is alive. It's a beautiful tradition. I love it. I love to pray in that way. But when you look at how exactly they are, they're um, progressing in their spiritual path is not just by taking plant medicine. Uh -huh. I mean, in the Native American church, the Lakota tribe, they take peyote every Sunday. It's a beautiful Sunday ceremony. Really? And I really, yeah. Have you watched this documentary, How to Change Your Mind, Michael Pollan? Of course. Uh, yeah. Based. Yeah, yeah. I read his book too. Yeah, yeah. So I really appreciate the guy because he's like, he realizes that peyote is a very, very uh, precious plant and it should be kept, it should be reserved for the natives of this plant. And he decides not to take peyote ever in his life out of his respect. Um, because these plants and these peoples are kind of connected. They're relative, they are close relatives. So when you interfere and you just want to take, and you just want to consume, you create negative energy. Like it's, true for ayahuasca for example there is a possibility that ayahuasca will extinct go extinct because people are not wow. uh, approaching it well you yeah? know wow. it has to grow a certain amount of years before you harvest it wow and because there's so much money right now people wow. in the amazon forest they just harvest it before it's time and wow. it doesn't have time to continue species you know like 
Shit. Um, so there's a lot of awareness. Kind of Ayahuasca is only grown, is only grown there, Fati? In the Amazon forest, as I know, yes. So can but we- Amazon is huge. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. It, can we take, hmm. because I know ayahuasca is like a seed or something. Can we harvest it somewhere else? Does it have to be a certain climate? Climate for sure. As I know, uh, huh. only in rainforest. Okay, but then we can grow it in Malaysia and, right? Maybe. Biologically, it is not recommended, you know? Because each species, like if you just take an avocado tree from North uh, South America and just want to plant it in Turkey, for example, it's not a good idea because it messes up with the ecosystem there. Sure, sure, There's sure. There's a reason uh, certain plants grow in certain parts of the world, right? Uh, Except fungi, I think. I mean, mushrooms are a different story. So that's why, like, I decided to cut off from these communities. I decided not to go to a certain ceremony unless it's like, I know the person, like I, one of my friends, I actually did my first ceremony with him like 10 years ago. He's my buddy for 20 years. I really love him, trust him and respect him. Maybe, just maybe, if I would do one day, I would do it with him. But otherwise, I'm done with it. And, wow. And let me give you this perspective too. Just before that, I was explaining in their spiritual path, there is something called a vision quest. Yep, yep. Okay. Tell me about that. Yeah. A vision quest is an event where you go up in a jungle alone, four days, no food and no drinks. You cannot take anything with you from the modern world. Even where you, you're going to sleep has to be traditional. You know, like you can't have your yoga mats, for example, or sleeping bag. So... And four days, you cannot socialize, you cannot leave a certain space, and you need to just focus and pray, and you need to do it and no plant medicine. You need to just do it four years in a row. And then you are graduated from the vision quest. And this vision quest is not about some psychedelic vision quest. It's about practical, pragmatical, spiritual, uh, life-oriented quest where you're asking yourself, who the fuck I am? You know, what the heck am I supposed to do in this life? Like it's a very David Tede kind of, you know, deepening the purpose kind of thing. It's also a rites of passage. You know, there's this concept of rites of passage. We, especially men, suffer a lot because around the time of industrial revolution, our society stopped doing this because there was this rites where the boyhood would stop and the yeah. boy of the tribe would recognize that he is not the boy anymore. He's a man. And in some of the tribes, even for example, in Africa, it would be something dangerous. They would leave the yep. boy in the jungle, no food, no water. He has to find his way back to the tribe. And some of that time they don't. So they lose the boy. Fuck. But if he comes back, we can trust this man. You know, he's going to be able to protect the tribe because life is hard. You know, like it's not that in this modern world, everything is so easy and there's this vision of safety. So vision quest is kind of a very popularized neo rise of passage. You know, even Dan Greenfield, for example, he's putting his kids, his teenager kids to do that. It's kind of beneficial and there is no plant medicine in it. Also, there is this another type of ceremony, which is called sweat lodge, where you, it's a very old type of ceremony. You go into this tiny tent. Yeah, it's uh, called Tamaskal in, 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 in Mexican Mexico. culture. Yeah, I've yeah, done Mexico it. Mexico yeah. is very popular. Yeah. 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 How was it? It was great, fucking great, bro. I did it uh, twice, and um, uh, did I do it twice or once? Yeah, I think I did it twice. I did it once in Merida, and uh, no, I think I've only done it once. I think I've only done it once. Yeah, in 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 Merida. Yeah, I did. I've done it once. It, it the it's other one practice, right? Well. Um, it was not so tough, the one I did, because it was short. Um, it was like, I think just uh, short. an hour or something, oh, 45 minutes or an hour. Well, that's, yeah. That's well, average. I've, so for example, Marta has done one, which was way longer. And she, really, like people quit. People just crawled out. She stayed the whole time. And that really tested her. 
She's done it a few times. And she said that when she got out of that and did it, the whole thing, she felt so empowered because she didn't think she could do it. And people walked out, crawled out. And uh, it was hot, hot, hot. And when we did ours in Merida, yeah, when we did ours, the floor was cold and the, the tent was hot. So there was this contrast. And I laid on the floor because we were allowed to. And so I caught like a little cold for a couple of days after. And one of the other guys who was actually from Ukraine, uh, he was there. Yeah, he was there. He's been in Mexico for many years. He was there and dude, he was sick for three weeks after. And he was on antibiotics after that. So I guess different people have different reactions, but I loved it. Temescal, man, I would do it so many times. I fucking love it. Yeah. It's a very pure and strong type of practice, not necessarily to have plant medicine. And a lot of people who have done many ayahuasca ceremonies, they don't have a clue about what is sweat lodge. They don't have a clue about what is vision quest. They don't do the hard work. You know, they're like, oh, just give me the pleasant parts of this thing, you know, like, and if you don't pay the price, if you don't sacrifice something, life will take its sacrifice from you, you know, you know this fact, I guess. So yeah, voluntary sacrifice. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, just to put things into perspective, the plant medicine traditions are based on non-plant medicine practices. First of all, they're kind of coming on top. Even when you look at uh, middle Asian, like Turkic Siberian shamanism, they are very, I think they are very strong as well. Um, I'm not sure if all of them are pure or whatever, like I don't have any, not, not much experience, but the thing is they don't drink any plant medicine and they can have amazing experiences without plant medicine. I mean, in most of these traditions, only the leader of the ceremony drinks, for example, in, in some regions, yeah, the rest of the people, it's not for you to drink something and have some visions, you know, like, so it's very skeptical, but I still love Kambo. Combo is very nasty, but it's very strong. It's very purifying. And I still love um, psilocybin mushrooms. But doing it in a group setting is very, very difficult because all people have different kind of reactions and you need to have harmony, right? You know, everybody has to have certain experience. Like if, if you're in a tribe, you don't have people acting out bizarrely, you know, like everybody's experience, everybody is doing what they are doing because they're one tribe they're praying yeah and they're experienced and everybody's good friends but in in the modern world you know like you go into an ayahuasca ceremony and you don't you you see random 90 percent of the people in your group you will never see them again and they vomit they do crazy shit and they mess up your trip maybe you know like so it's not very effective you know got it it's, it's not very effective. I would choose another path. I would choose because I don't have so much time and money and effort and concentration. I would spend it on something else that really works, that is really harmonious. Uh, you know, could be a meditation retreat, could be doing something, something hard. Home alone. Something, something hard. Something that you also, yeah, you know, yoga retreat, a meditation retreat, a tantra workshop, you know. Fatih, work. I want to ask you about... Um, the history of plant medicine also because it's an interesting topic i really like this topic a lot so there's a theory that christianity started from mushrooms right there's a theory that uh, i think the book is called like the sacred mushroom of the cross or something like that and also this new book came out the immortality key uh and the guy who wrote it brian mirror rescue was on jordan peterson podcast and i read some of the book also not all of it, but just some of it. And it's interesting to see that so many of these traditions, uh, and you know, Graham Hancock, the guy who recently made a Netflix documentary. Yeah. So Graham Hancock wrote the foreword of that book and he wrote it with Brian and, uh, listening to Graham and other people who've like been in this field for like 30, 40, 50 years, there's a theory that a lot of great inventions came out of this. So for example, in, in Greece, there's a place called uh, Olysses, um, Olysses uh, where they did uh, basically an initiation. 
and um, and Marcus Aurelius went to that, right? Like other people went to that. The the they even say that democracy came out of that, and it was something that is very hidden, very secret. You weren't supposed to tell anyone about what happened inside. And from the research, there's a theory that they had certain psychedelic drinks inside and they had visions and they were all going inward and, and thinking about the, the future and thinking about their society and the world and the universe. And we know how smart the Greeks were. We know what came out of the Greek culture. It's like some unbelievable stuff as well as the Roman culture. And so Brian did literally spend like 12 years of his life. Uh, you know, he was a lawyer. He stopped law and went on a 12 year quest to write this book to figure out, did Christianity come from psychedelics? Literally. The whole thing. And uh, make Christians very angry, I guess. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But he, he went to the Vatican and he interviewed a lot of people at the Vatican and he said he was received very well. Very, very well received. Uh, maybe they didn't know what he was going to do. But he was very well, uh, uh, he was very happy with the interactions he had with the Vatican. But do you, have you uh, thought about this or have you thought like maybe mushrooms give us such visions because they want to survive? It's an evolutionary mechanism, right? Because if we have these visions with psilocybin, we're going to keep them alive. Guess what, right? And we also know from Paul Stamets and other like mycologists that mushrooms have been around for for. Three billion years, two bit no, well, not maybe not four, but because Earth is four, maybe like two billion years, long ass time before everyone, before plants, before right. So, what what are your what do you feel about this? Like religion and all this is is it just a bunch of people with schizophrenia doing plant medicine, <laughs> and now we have religion? Yes like, and no. Yes and no. You know, like, I mean, it's a, even. Like I want to tell you this story, like um, in a Su from a Sufi tradition, there's this yeah. town, and there is two masters, two Sufi circles, and one of them, the guy, the teacher, is very honest. He's guiding them very well, telling the truth all the time, but he doesn't have a lot of followers. The other one has tons of followers, very famous, but most of the time cheating on people. I'm not, not really guiding them from the right spiritual perspective. And the followers of this guy, the first guy, is like pissed off with this. They are like, hey, you are telling the truth, but you have just a bunch of followers, us. And this guy is messing up with people and everybody's following him. Why is that? He smiles and he says, if he wouldn't exist, I wouldn't do my work. If he wasn't there, Everybody would be coming to me and I wouldn't do my real work. So it's always like this, like it's only a small minority of people, like small circles uh, who are dedicated, who do the real work. And the masses, they will always, always, always need a simple solution and probably being misled. And that's why there's church, you know, there's big religions, there's cults. So if you want to find the truth, we need to find it in small groups or individually. Wow. Got it. I digress. What was your question? No, no, the, the digression's okay. Uh, speaking of groups, do you, especially, uh, and I want to get, get, get your thoughts on COVID and stuff, like uh, like what happened and like uh, your journey. And I know the, the I also want to get your thoughts on war and what you experienced, right, during the, like still going on, obviously, but at, in the beginning of it. Because I know you made some videos and like in retrospect, I want you to kind of dissect what happened in your own consciousness. But before we do that, what what is consciousness to you? Because this this word is being thrown out, thrown around everywhere. And in the neuroscience community where I'm from, the concept of consciousness is like pseudoscience. They're like, what the hell? You're talking about consciousness? Your career is over. Because it's like uh, it's like talking about a spirit spirituality or talking about uh, uh, energy, right? Like we don't do that in neuroscience because you cannot, you cannot experiment with it, um, especially not properly or with control. So what is consciousness to you and what role does it play 
in uh, our life. Well, they were asking really hard questions today. Like, I'm not a neuroscientist to explain this, but from my understanding, consciousness is something that is um, separating us from animals. What do I mean by that? I mean, animals don't have a meta conscious, meta thinking. You know, like they don't think that, oh, I'm doing something wrong. I need to correct my behavior. So, right? You have done a lot right. of experience with uh, chimps and stuff. So, right. and that's what's there's no shame and guilt. <laughs> <laughs> the monkey doesn't have shame. Yeah. So, shame and guilt is part of our consciousness, for example. But we can have a expanded consciousness or more evolved consciousness that helps us to deal with shame and guilt in a way that we're still happy and satisfied in life. But some people are stuck in that level. So we have consciousness as humans, but we have very different levels of consciousness. That's another subject. So does it answer your question? What role does it play in your life? Like, are you feeling it all the time or are you like because sam sam always says like whenever he gets in a craving or a temptation or some thought it takes him four seconds to get back because he reaches for the present moment and now he's back mm -hmm. so what role as i know yeah i i was actually doing his meditations for some time you know, like awesome me too yeah waking up app I yep think. yep 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 me too so yeah. uh but i I stopped doing because it was way too complicated. I was like, it was irritating for me to try to learn something new every day. And I switched back to Anapana meditation, which is very, very, very simple. You know, like, What's that? Uh, prerequisite. Uh, you do it before Vipassana, right? You ah. Just breath awareness. Just focus on right. breathing. Nothing. I remember. Equanimously, don't try to change anything. Just do it. So uh, Sam Harris is also, I think, is a very secular guy, right? Very. A debate atheist. Person, like he's... It is he's very atheist, atheist. So, yeah. yeah, but he's not fully not spiritual. He's doing Buddhist meditations and he's aware of the nature of the mind. So what he said, what did you quote of what he said? Ah, he can stop his uh, cravings very quickly because he trained his mind to do so. So here's the thing that I like about atheist secular spiritual approach, that it's everything is kind of technical. If you get the technique right, you don't have to have faith so much, you know? And this brings me to a kind of perspective from the yoga tradition, yoga training that I had. There are different types of yoga, okay? There is jnana yoga, karma yoga, and bhakti yoga, for example, the first fundamental traditional types of yoga, and therefore different type of people. Bhakti yoga means the devotional yoga. This is for people who are like have a lot of hearts, a lot of love. You know, maybe Pakistani people, maybe females are more prone to that. They just want to love the gods, you know, like they don't care. They don't question so much about if this is real or not real. It's kind of pointless for them because they know in their heart that there is God. They love cosmic consciousness, whatever. And they should be kept alone. You know, like they should be doing whatever they want to do. And people like Sam Harris, they are doing Yana yoga. They are doing the yoga of the knowledge, of the mind focus, concentration, meditation, and finding the truth in that way, which is also very beautiful. And there's karma yoga, it's the action yoga, you know, service to people, mm -hmm. society. These people, they don't have so much devotion. They don't have so much meditative powers. Maybe they're overthinking, they're running from one place to another all the time, but they have a lot of action that they can take and they want to take the karma yoga path, right? And it could be a synthesis of them, which is the famous book of uh, Sri Aurobindo, like the synthesis of yoga, how to synthesize them, you know, to make a new type of yoga. And so this can go, this is another rabbit hole, but basically this is something that we need to really appreciate a lot when we talk about spiritual paths or any kind of self-development uh, methodology. Everybody is unique. Something that fits you doesn't fit me, maybe. And something that I love very much that works for me, maybe doesn't work for you. And if you and me, we are quite in the same league, you know, we are similar people. If we can have so much differences in our preferences, imagine the whole humanity. Right. right. So what Sam Harris does works for Sam Harris and people like Sam Harris. 
Got and it. what Jordan Peterson does works for people like Jordan Peterson. So we need to find out our unique right. path. Right. Is there one truth you believe? Like for there's the same way reason no. Okay. I mean, maybe yes. So I would say maybe yes and no. Like, yes, for example. But I don't know what it is. Okay. I believe because, it, like, for example, as, as we're talking right now, there's, like, gamma radiation and there's, like, you know, there's different electromagnetic spectrum. There's infrared. There's all this stuff. You know, there's molecules floating around. I can't see it. Right? There's sound waves. I can't see them. Right? I can't see the energy. But perhaps that's truth. I can't feel it. I can't see it, but it's there. So what is, what is our, our place here? Like in the world, are we trying to seek the truth? Are we trying to stay in the present moment? Are we just sharing love? Are we playing and sharing play and, and fun? Like how, what is this life to you? What is life all about? It's something to be lived, you know, just explore, find out every day, you know, every day is a mystery. Every day we learn something new. Like even in this conversation, we learn so many new things from each other. You know, sharing, sharing, I think is the point. Sharing and finding the meaning and finding your purpose, you know, because the world would miss when you're gone. The world would miss you when you're gone. Our presence, and, and this is true for everyone, we have something unique to contribute to the world. When we're gone, the world is missing that part. To find meaning in life is about your, what is your unique contribution and how can you offer it? Like, um, do you know this? Um, it was a song, Buzz Lurman. We are sunscreen. It was a single came out in 1990s, like end of night, maybe 2000 wow. or 2000. It was like a supposed, it's, it was like a graduation speech that was uh, dubbed by somebody else. But Buzz Rowland is this famous director who shot Elvis. So and at some point he says, he's talking to the university college graduates, right? And he's saying, some of the most interesting people that I know don't know what they want to do with their lives when they're 25. But some of the most interesting people that I know still don't know when they're 40 or something like that. Right now I'm 45. I still don't know exactly what I'm going to do with my life. But I know that there are certain things that I can serve to humanity, like the tantra coaching uh, for men especially and masculinity, you know, character development, mindset, spiritual growth. And also I have this Mayan astrology website that has been with me for 15 years, you know, that, uh, I really love to follow up on. It's a very interesting type of wisdom from the Mayas, very secular, but very interesting at the same time. I mean, secular in the sense that you don't have to pray, you don't have to take plant medicine, but it still works. Yeah, man. I wanted to ask you about Mayans too, because. I live in Tulum, obviously, and we, this is the place of the Mayans and we've gone to the Mayan ruins uh, about a month ago. We went, it was great. It was wonderful to see it. Um, uh, we talked to a lot of people who came from the Mayan tradition, right? They, they're very short, short people. And um, a lot of them speak Mayan, but a lot of them don't speak Mayan anymore. They just speak Spanish. And there's, there's this, um, to take us a little bit into Mayan history, why are Mayans so important to the world? What did they contribute? What type of people were they? And what happened to them? Well, um, I guess Mayans, Mayans were not the unique uh, peoples of the ancient world that were so um, interesting, I would say. Like the Incas, the Olmecs, um, and so many other tribes around the world are also very, very interesting. What makes Mayans unique, at least in my eyes, is their uh, keen astronomical science, 
Like they were very, very good observers of what's happening astronomically without any telescopes, you know, like they had their observatories, like in Chichen Itza, there's a huge observatory. Um, they were somehow very good mathematicians as well. And they were able to really track things very accurately. For example, they have one calendar called Hub. It's a sun calendar, solar calendar. And every 52 years, it's a 365 days calendar with an exception that every 52 years, there is a 13 year gap that is added at the end of that year. And when you divide 13 days into 52 years, it's like 0 0.25 days, right? So they were aware of the leap year as well. Wow. So this is just one small example of how good they were astronomically and spiritually as well, because they had, they, they just don't have one calendar. They have many different calendar systems. And one of them is Zolkin or Cholkish. And it's a sacred calendar that has this 260 day cycle, which has 20 day signs and 13 numbers. And a combination of them make 260. And this is a calendar that is specifically used for individual guidance, right? Like we all are unique. We are all different. So this helps, for example, a new child is born in the tribe and based on the birthday of the child, they already start designing the life. For example, if he is better to be a shaman or a scientist or an artist, so they can uh, educate the child accordingly having a consciousness since the birth. And this is the system that I'm using for this astrological readings and my astrological sites uh, that you can, because it's a very, it's a unique calculation system. Like every day is different. For example, you were born on January 20th, January 20th, 1979. 82, 82. Ah, oh, sorry. 82. I'm off by three years. Yeah. So. January 20, yeah. so in, it, two zero. That would put you in Aquarius in the classical astrology. But am I right? Or Capricorn? Cusp. Cusp. Okay. So you're in the cusp between Capricorn and Aquarius. Uh, but every year, 20th of January is the same. They're in the cusp. But your mind sign is unique. Somebody who was born on 20th of January 1981 or 83 would be a completely different sign. And somebody who was born on 19th of January or 21st of January, 1982 would also be a completely different sign. So it's a day based and it's not astronomical, interesting enough. They were very, very good astronomically. Still, they didn't base their spiritual individual calendar on astronomy at all, because we don't observe this 20 day cycle or 13 day cycle or 260 day cycle astronomically. So why, if they're so good with astronomy, why wouldn't they base their individual guidance calendar, the so-called astrological calendar on the astronomical cycles? They argue there is a deeper truth. Uh, I mean, I, wish, I shouldn't say they argue. I would need to say that based on this evidence, this observation, it is evident that the system is based on a deeper spiritual time cycle uh, pattern. And that's not physically observed. That is metaphysically observed. That's very, very esoteric. And that's, that works, man. That works like crazy. You know, I'm, I came across with this like uh, 15 years ago or something. And I'm all the time amazed, like why, how accurate it is, you know, like in terms of personality analysis, in terms of synchronicities happening, because we have certain days that are, for example, more uh, adequate for something to do with the business because we have male sign days and female sign days, for example, male sign days are great to do something with your business. And those days I really take big decisions about my, how my business works. And there are other days that are very, very good for intimate relationships, like friendships, family uh, issues. Today is such a day for me in the Mayan calendar. So it's a great day for us to connect, you know, like do this friendly talk, you know? So, and this is something that completely experimental. I'm not believing any dogma here. You know, like I say, okay, this is the information, take it, experiment it. 
and see the results and do it again and again and again and do it for many, many years, it becomes yeah. self-evident. So when you say it works, does that mean, because in science, obviously we have to do control experiments and, you know, monitor and statistics and there's a lot of stuff. So for something to work, it would have to be perhaps a non-placebo effect. And we also know from literature, neuroscience literature, that when you believe in something, that's huge. I mean, that's a huge shit, believing. Like if you believe that some diet is good for you, truly believe it. Mm -hmm. And it's not some bullshit like cookies. It's going to do better for you than if you didn't believe. Same thing with working out, same thing with meditation, same thing with breath work. The belief is huge for the mind. It's the placebo effects. And I would say... So... Yeah. Okay, finish your question. No, no. I was just wondering, the Mayans, if they developed, let's call it bullshit, right? Let's say they developed some bullshit, like whatever. But now, the tribe believes it fully. So the bullshit, because we believe in it, works. I, I question things from this perspective a lot. And that's why I did, for example, during this 15 years, at some points, I just completely dropped it. You know, like, I'm, not, I'm not paying any attention to this. Like, let it just get out of my life, you know? For like a couple of months, maybe years, and someday, oh God, what happened? Like, this was such a crazy day and this happened that, and I look at this calendar and like, it's my fucking most important day or something, you know? Like, it's like, wow, it was a day of this. But this is one way of confirming. The other way of confirming is this. Like, I have this website that is running for 10 years. You go there, enter uh -huh. the date of birth, and you do a simple free report. And then if you like it, you can buy a full report or not. But it's like amusing me still to this day that so many high ratio of people are reading it and say, this is so accurate about me. And what can I do about this? You know, like I'm not trying to convince them. There's that what kind of bias could be here? Like why would so many people want to believe so much in my website? They well, let me, let me give you a, let me, let me give you a very interesting idea that you can do to sort of do a real experiment. All the predictions from the Mayan calendar make something or, or develop some AI algorithm or, or I'm sure they already exist online where you take a pair, you tell Jichad GPT, say, take this paragraph and write me the opposite. Okay. And then feed that. Okay. And if people still say, this is correct. And you know it's BS. But experiments should have to be run first before deciding it's BS. I mean, yeah, it's an experiment that should be done. And I, I, I know there were some experiments about astrology in this way, in the scientific literature, this about this uh, bias of the mind, horoscopes plas and placebo effects and whatnot. But here's the thing, you know, like, even if this is an illusion, this is a better illusion. Than the, because a lot of people come and tell me, you know, like the classical astrology helps me to a certain extent, but with the Maya, it's much more accurate. It's helping wow. me much more. For example, um, like my own story, I am heavily Aquarius, okay, in the classical astrology. Four of my plans are in Aquarius. My rising is Gemini, air signs. I have nothing to do with Scorpio, for example. And Scorpio is famous for his, uh, what should I call it? Um, libido, right? Sexual attitudes. But I have this a lot. I always felt like I have huge libido. Sexuality has always been a concept important in my life. That's why I'm into Tantra. I'm still teaching about sexuality. So, and all of those answers are found in the mind astrology because my sign there is the Khan or cut in different Maya language or the seed as I translated. It's very individualized based. It's very sexual. And that explained a lot of, ah, like, oh, okay, that's why I had this. And 
tells you that don't try to run away from this. Take care of this. You need to work with it. You know, because if I wouldn't have this information, I would maybe have more issues with my libido, because it brings me right this awareness that hey, take care of this. This is important for me. When is your birthday? Seventh of Feb. Ah, uh, happy birthday, bro! Thank you. <laughs> and I, if you want, <laughs> I can share with you. You're in the cusp of my career, so you may relate. I can send you my list of Aquarius people, like the people who were born in Aquarius. Like pretty much I can guess 40 to 50% of the time, you know, like if I read about the story of a celebrity or somebody, you know, oh, this person might be a Leo person or this might, this person might be an Aquarius person. And somehow, like, especially in some signs, like in Aquarius, I get it. Like he's an Aquarius. Because Aquarius people, especially, I know we are a little bit crazy, you know, we are out of the ordinary. We think differently from, I mean, this is what these astrologers say. And when you look at it, um, the Aquarius people have a tendency to then dominate the space they are in. They dominate the field that they are, they are in. Michael Jordan is an Aquarius. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo is an Aquarius. When you think sure. of classical music, who, who would you think of? Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, Chopin. Mozart. Yeah, Mozart yeah. is Aquarius, like with his creativity, you know, like. So, um, where's my list? I want to share with you my list if you don't mind. Yeah, please. I would love that. I mean, talking about astrology stuff is not my most favorite thing to talk with you, but it's just for the fun of it, right? <laughs> what about Capricorn? What's Capricorn? Capricorns have a tendency to be famous, uh, but I don't know really much. I mean, be, besides that, they're disciplined, they're very um, orderly, usually. But there's exceptions. There's all kind of different things. Just want to tell you a few things uh, from my Aquarius list. Like um, when you think of reggae music, who would you think of? Which music? Reggae. Or reggae. Um, that Marley, Bob Marley. Bob Marley, he's Aquarius. Um, so for example, minimalistic music is a type of classical music. Philip Glass is a chorus. Uh, Eckhart Tolle, Ken Wilber, if you know Ken Wilber. He's yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I do. I do. Yeah. Christian Bale, who is able to go into so many different characters and acting. Uh, Muji, this. Yeah, I know Muji. Yeah. S seen many videos of Muji. Yeah. Yeah. David Goggins. Aquarius. Yeah. Anyway, so I have most musicians here, but there is some truth to it. I wouldn't say it's the absolute truth. But there is some truth to it. Mm. Very interesting. Um, Fatih, uh, we, we did a lot of uh, stuff today. I want to, yeah. as a last, last uh, sort of uh, thing, I want to get into the present day and the future. What holds to the future? One of the things that is very important is routine. And we've talked about this in the past. In Kiev, we, we had discussions about this when you came over and we yeah. were talking about like breath work and meditation and all that and working out. And So yeah. tell me about your current routine. What things are you doing every day that are good for Tantra? For uh, I know you wrote, wrote the book, right? Like uh, uh, love, what was it? Love Like a Buddha? Um, Fuck what like was a it? king. Fuck like a king. That's great. I yeah, I remember. I changed that title, man. Sorry to tell you. Sorry that's okay. That's okay. All good, man. All good. Whatever makes you happy, man. I, I don't mind. <laughs> Whatever makes you successful, man. It's all, all that matters. So, um, so yeah, and that's a great book. A lot of people should should check that out. And and I don't know if you've written any books after that, but um, take us back into uh, writing that book the routines that you need to be disciplined and to focus, because that required a lot of work. I remember when you were writing it and the takeaways from that time, which was three, four years ago until now, what has been the takeaway? Well, first of all, I have to give it to you. I learned a lot from you. Okay. You've been a great friend to me and a great mentor and a coach. I really like being in touch with you because you have a strong drive and you really inspire people to take action. 
I really love it. I really thanks, man. Thank you. And then you, as a friend, helped me to put my shit together in life, which is precious. So I'm grateful for Thank your you, presence man. in my life. So and yes, I have written another another book about Mayan astrology, but it wow. was not so difficult for me because I've been into it for more than a decade now. But the Tantra book was more challenging because it was something new that I need to pull things together. And right now, if I write a book, it will be two, three times better in quality uh. and knowledge because I had so much experience with my clients now. So I really love individual coaching in Tantra because as I always say, everybody is unique and individual. Some guy might take more yoga stuff and they like to practice more yoga. And I give them more of those technology. And some other guy who's not even into so much uh, orgasm without ejaculation, but he needs to fix his relationship with girls. You know, like then it's more of a, like a dating coach kind of thing. You know, another guy, everything is perfect. He's killing it in the gym. You know, like he's very handsome, but he needs to work on self-confidence. Another guy, he's completely lost in his career. So even though he learns Tantra, it doesn't work for him at all because he's going to be poor in the next six months, then we fix his career, you know? So I, it's like situational awareness, right? Like, so what's the most important thing for you in your life and what works for you and what doesn't work for you? I love coaching because I'm able to manage all that process with my clients instead of just bulking them with some information, you know, like video courses, books. There's information everywhere now, but coaching is what matters the most in terms of taking um, results, getting I results. Agree. I agree. In terms of my routine, my routine always keep changing. Yeah. But there's one routine that didn't change for the last 15 years, which is my Kundalini yoga practice, like my tantric practice, which involves a lot of sublimation. So it helps me tremendously because there are times that I don't have a partner in my life, for example. I don't have a sexual partner and I don't need a sexual partner, not just because I'm masturbating like crazy, but I'm able to change the energy system in my body and have more sublimation and less sexual energy is disturbing. Sometimes if I don't ejaculate for a couple of months, whatever sublimation you do, the testosterone is going like crazy. So I sometimes have a wet dream or lose it here and there, uh, but it helps me tremendously. So that's the main routine that I'm following. Of course, a little bit of meditation followed after that. And, uh, right now my favorite one is journaling. So every morning when I wake up the first 20 minutes, like right after I wash my face, I sit on my desk for 20, 25 minutes. I just journal. I love it. I love and it. And it's so helpful. It's like, so, so therapy. great to clean your minds. Yeah. Therapy. It's, it's so good. And then, yeah, I try to postpone the coffee as much as later into the day because uh. of what Andrew Huberman says. Because of Bro, avoiding afternoon crash. I haven't what? had coffee for about 11 weeks. Great. 11 weeks. Zero. Congratulations. Yeah, I made a have decision. You when... listen, have you listened to the uh, Medical Medium podcast on coffee? Medical Medium? No. I don't yeah, even you know. You should listen to it. You should listen to it. Don't take it with a pinch of salt, but it's interesting. Listen, especially when you quit coffee. I'm not gonna put. I'm not gonna put salt in my coffee. Are you crazy? I'm saying listening to podcasts. I know. I know. I know. I know. Ah, okay. He's it, teasing me. He's it ta taken with a pinch of salt? I don't think so. No. no. Ben Greenfield does it. He puts some salt in his coffee. Mm. I bet he does. I I do make a cocktail uh, every morning: a cocoa, uh, cocoa with uh, maple syrup, with butter, um, salt. Um, some, some, uh, lavender, some, um, what is that thing called? Uh, cloves. It's really mm -hmm. good stuff. Today I didn't make it cause I, was, I had this stupid podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Wake up early. So, uh, okay. So routine. Yeah. I, uh, so, yeah, so that, so me. your, your Kundalini is the 15 year, you know, st stable Steady practice routine. I, wow. I call it my main practice. Like. It's like, wow, it's like a building, right? It's my foundation and I, I build it. It helps me with my, uh, a lot of things like has huge benefits, you know, like more energy, more libido, yeah. more drive. 100%. Um, yeah. And, and, and can you just go ahead? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, please. 
and then I put other practices on top. Like um, uh, I go back to my self gym practice. Sometimes there are things happening in life and I can't exercise at all for a couple of weeks and I go back on track. But right now I'm more dedicated in that. And of course, shooting videos, creating content, marketing, following up with advertisements, you know, like these are not routines, but why not to call it a routine? Because it's helping with your life, you know, to make money. We have to follow up with things. So of course, contrast showers every morning, like at the moment, I don't have a bath that I can have a ice bath, but cold exposure is really, really essential. It's like something that's steadily in my life for the last five years, I guess every day wow. I do it. Yeah. This so very cool, man. Helpful. So cool. One thing, Fatih, and, and this is just, uh, um, you said some very kind words to me about, you know, inspiring you and stuff. So just uh, uh, something new that I've added to my own life, which may help you, is uh, basically the routine that I have brought into my life is like, it's like a ninja level somehow. Okay. So I wake up at the same time every single day seven days a week it's i mean it's not exactly because i don't have an alarm i just bought an, an analog alarm so i can set it if i need for like podcasts for example because i don't want to have a phone phone with me anywhere close to me and uh but i wake up somewhere between 3 30 4 30. it's sometimes like 3 45 sometimes it's 3 30 sometimes it's 4 15 it just depends and uh, but it's around four and then after about a half an hour meditation and f by the way for the first time in my life I'm enjoying meditation. First time. Like genuinely loving it. Like I Is it wake because up because you stop drinking coffee? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think it's that simple. I don't think it's that simple. I think it's probably 25 different things into into this. I don't think you can attribute it to one thing. I don't think so. Okay. So I wake up and I lie in bed. Usually I would like fall asleep because I'm like lying in my bed meditating, but I never do. I'm awake and I'm like concentrating and I'm loving the thing. Whatever it is, thoughts come, they go, breathing comes, it goes. You know, I do nasal breathing all the time also. Uh, all day I try to do nasal breathing, no mouth breathing. I try my best. Um, I also experimented with taping my mouth at night so I don't breathe from my mouth while I'm... Uh, okay. This is something I learned from James Nestor, his book <laughs> Breath. And uh, yeah. the technique is you take a little piece of tape medical tape, put it on your mouth like this, you cover it yeah. up. And I then tried you, you it just, too. You, you know, so you know. Yeah. So uh, that, and uh, and then I have about a 45 minute to one hour routine where I do the, you know, the the, the, the simple stuff, you know, brushing my teeth. Um, I do oil pulling um, with coconut oil. I um, go and, you know, to open the, the curtains. I... Uh, come in this room, I turn on my, my lamps, so on. And um, while I do this, either I'm with myself, with my own thoughts, or I put on uh, a podcast because I fucking love podcasts so much, more than anything. And then I come here, uh, it's probably around 4.45-ish, uh, 5 o'clock, and I start work. At 7, gym time, right? And weekends is 8 because it opens up later. But the, the moment the gym opens up at 7, me and Martha are there. And uh, we're there till 8.30. It's a deadline. Like 8.30, we got to go. No matter what. If we, if we wake up late, we fuck around, something happens, we get to the gym at 7.30, it doesn't matter. We're still leaving at 8.30. And in the weekends, gym opens at 8, we leave at 9.30. Okay? At the gym, we start off with breath work. Four rounds Wim Hof. Either I go into reception or extra receptions. Either I'm closing my eyes, going with myself, or I open my eyes, I focus on one spot on the tree that I'm, I'm in front of a tree and I'm grounded, right? I have feet, feet in, in the dirt. I'm looking at one spot on the tree and I'm just meditating to that spot. And I'm taking in everything that's... that's... Actually, that's another technique uh, from yoga tradition called Trataka. Oh, it's what's it amazing called? I, I love it. Trataka. Oh, wow. It's called one dot Trataka. There are different types of Tratakas. Like you can also do it on a candle light. But, Got it. you know, like in our school, we even have to have uh, tests. Like our teacher was very much like a martial arts kind of mental, having mentality. <laughs> so we used yeah. to have uh, belts, like reds and 
orange oh, and yellow, it would go up like that. Yeah. And in each of these tests, there would be some technical, theoretical questions and practical things. Like, like how can you hold headstands? Like, if you can hold 10 minutes, you get five points or something like that. And one Perfect. of them was Trateka. Like, just no blinking, no winking, just minimum five minutes, focus on a dot, like at the level of your third eye. It's helping amazingly with concentration and focus and purifying yeah. your mind, actually. It's a very deep wow. technique. I love that. I just learned it from Huberman. He said extra reception. He talked about it. That's it. Cool. cool. And so, Nestor? Huberman, Andrew Huberman. Ah, uh, Huberman. Okay. In the meditation lecture. How okay. to meditate. I will listen to it. Yeah, extra reception. And so, that, and then we do ice bath. Anywhere from three to five minutes. We have an actual ice bath, you know, with like, like Joe Rogan style uh, at the gym. And so we sit in that, both of us. Uh, either we take turns or we do go together. Either whatever we feel. Then it's workout, 45 minutes. And uh, the workout is I'm following a coach in Austin. So I have his one-year course. So I'm on month four right now. So whatever the, 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 the technique is, I do it. And the, the goal of the one year is to connect the body. So connect the big toe with the shoulder, right? Connect the hips with, with your, with your uh, feet, right? Connect the, the, the core with your upper, your, 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 your arms. Like it's just connecting the whole body to each other. Align. You mean neurologically? Ah, oh, okay. Um, it's more about bones, bone alignment. Because hey, if your bones okay. are aligned, then when you're walking, instead of using your knees, you're going to use your feet. You know, a lot of people, they have knee problems, hip problems, back problems. Why? Because when they walk, they're not using their feet because the feet are not aligned. They're, they're walking like this, you know, like ducks and stuff like my mom used to. But anyway, so do that, then home, uh, uh, work, breakfast. Then we go to the co-working space, work there, come home. Um, unless we have to do errands, we run errands. Come home and at 7 p.m., phones off. No exceptions. 7 p.m. No phones, no screens, no exceptions. That's no. excellent. Yep. And, hey. and then, and, and we, we did this, uh, we decided to do this uh, like when we first started a relationship. Like that was like a thing we started way early. Um, 7 p.m. phones off and then 8, we're in bed. Every day. And this has never happened in my life. Never happened in my life. And uh, so Marte is a very good partner for you supporting in all this. This oh, is very important, bro. It's uh, thanks God. I thank God that this happened because it didn't have to, right? It didn't have to. And uh, whatever the journey was, you know, because I can see the journey, what happened, ups and downs, ups and downs. I, I see what happened and what happened early on, what happened in the middle. And the whole thing, all I can say is thank God. Thank God. Like, it's a gem. I found a gem. Because um, we are so aligned in every way. All those things, all checkmarked, man. And I'm so, like, feel lucky, man. Mashallah, I, I feel lucky, man. Thank God. Um, yeah, bro. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very... Th and, and, and that's the thing. Like, I always tell her, too. Like, uh, this love saved my life. Because God knows what path I was on. Right? God knows. Um, I, I don't know where I would have ended up. And now with this, I, I get what stability is. Like I can, for the first time in my life, imagine fully having a family. Fully. And I'm excited for it, man. Like I'm literally excited for the nights that I can't sleep. Like fucking bring it on, bitch. Bring on <laughs> the low prolact, like the, the high prolactin, <laughs> low testosterone. Bring it on. <laughs> like seriously, seriously. Yeah, that's how you should so, feel before being a father. Exactly, right? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, so bring it ready. on, man. Yeah, cool. And I'm, I'm excited for it. And uh, Fatih, a last topic I want to discuss, uh, final, final topic, is uh, your experience of the war. Um, I see it from a perspective of like what I talked to Sergey about, La Dunia, um, some other people watching some podcasts and kind of seeing the news and blah, blah, blah. But from your perspective, you being close to it, uh, with your, with your, uh, ex-wife and, uh, you know, her, her being, uh, I don't know where she is right now, but you know, you having the very close relationship with Ukraine, that's how we met 
right? We we met right in yep. front of Gulliver on the side street. <laughs> I still remember what, when I met you. Um, yeah. All of that kind of take us through a journey of put us there and make us feel how you felt and still feel. You want me to describe in a way that you felt the way I felt? No. That's what you I mean? want you to take us on that journey of experiencing the war from your perspective so we can get a little glimpse of what you were feeling in your heart. Yeah, it's going to be extremely subjective, bro. Are I you know. ready for it? Yeah. I'm totally ready. That's all I care about. Your perspective. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I guess I'm not a Ukrainian who was living in Ukraine at the moment. Bonds with a woman that is mother of my child. She's five years old and along with that, she was even younger. Um, so here's the thing. The real war that I had was with her. I mean, my ex-wife before. Right. Like I, I been on social media many times, like saying that I've been already in war for the last <laughs> couple of years since 2019. So even when COVID hit, it didn't really hit me hard because I was already a Spartan. I was already very stoic, you know, like things, the hellish, the most hellish year in my life was 2019, going through the divorce and going through the conflicts. And 2020 wasn't easy in that sense as well. So when COVID hits, for me, wow. it was like desert, desert, right? You know, like just something on top. Okay, I can, I can handle this. What is this, you know, like, so That's insane. when the war came, I had a similar thing because the main issue was like, here's the really interesting part of the story. So 24th of February, 2022, I wake up in Odessa with a loud explosion. Okay. So yeah, we were already getting prepared. I was like, uh, that Saturday, I was planning to fly out of Ukraine anyway. That so Saturday. Wait, so tw 20, yeah. 24th, February, 2022. Yeah, the first day of the war. So a year ago, basically, a, about a year ago. Yes. Approx. That time you were in Odessa for how long? One and a half year, maybe a bit less. Oh, so you were in Odessa for a while. Shit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because she moved from Kiev to Odessa, and if right, I want right, to see, right. if I want to see my daughter, where sure. would I be living? What, what did the What did the I don't know how much you want to get into this, but I would love if you could get into it. What did you have to like go to court and like fight for the for the girl? We haven't for done actually. Uh, unfortunately, we're still married on paper because uh, it's very complicated. Sure. To, to get a divorce is very complicated. One, if you have a child, and second, if you are from different countries, so oh, the fuck. law gets complicated. But so you got married of, in Ukraine? Like Ukraine was the official country of marriage? Yes, the first marriage was, and then it's been recognized in Turkey Three. as well. Got it, got it, got so, it. So, I mean, recently sent me some papers that if I fill in it, it will be easy. It's something that I don't really pay attention to, but it will happen sooner yeah. or later. But just to get a perspective, to build up to the, the war in, 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 in Ukraine, let's go to the war between... Yeah with you. Let, let's talk about that perspective because that might be, it's a bigger war even. I mean, I will tell you a little anecdote that will explain both. So sure, sure, sure. 24th of this, 24th of February, the war started and I'm like anxious, you know, quite anxious. Of course, who wouldn't be, you know, but she wouldn't be, you know, like she was like, oh, just chill out, relax. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we will, we will stay here. You know, like what, what are you talking about? We had a kid, you know, like there's a war. The Russians can come in any moment, you know, like I was watching all the uh, theories about how the invasion would took place. And one potential scenario was that they would cut the roads between Odessa and the West and start encircling Odessa city. And we would be stuck inside the city, like with many cities have done, Mariupol, Militopol, even Kharkiv to, some ex to a certain extent. And that was potentially what happened to this. And I'm like, we don't have even one hour to lose. We need to get going. And she's like, oh, I don't trust you. We need to travel with my boyfriend. Okay, let's go with your boyfriend. Where's your wow. boyfriend? He, he's not in Odessa. He's helping somebody else with his car outside of the city. And he will get back in two or three days. And I'm like, okay, let's wait. But the next day, the war continues. And I'm like, okay, I have a plan. I will take our daughter. We'll go to Romania 
and you will come with your boyfriend later and we will meet after the border. Okay? Okay. So this is like a phone conversation in the morning. What is the relationship between your daughter and both of you in terms of bonding, love, time spent, sharing? Individually, individually we are quite good. You know, like we were spending okay. almost half, half. Like she would stay with me two, three days and stay with her mother like for four days of the rest of the week. So it was pretty well. Um, so, so we agree and I pick up my kid is with me and I try to find a taxi or some like a, some way to get, get out of the country basically. And I call but her you and don't say, have, it. but you don't have like an emotional attachment to Ukraine. Like you're not in love with the country. You're not like, oh my God, my country, my people, none of no. that shit. Got it. Not much. Not, I mean, of course I have compassion. I have a lot of Ukrainian friends. Sure. Sure. Uh, sure. My developer is Ukrainian. I'm happy to pay him, you know, for example, things that I am with them. I, I take their side, you know, but not as much as a Ukrainian. But the point is this, like it was really a revealing moment in those three days, because we stayed in Odessa for three days when the war was going on. We left only on the fourth morning. Uh, in, wow. in those three days, somehow I take a taxi and there are a lot of Turkish taxi drivers in Odessa. I'm in this car. He's driving. His name is same with me. He's Fatih. He has a boy, five years old, from a Ukrainian wife. Very similar story. Shit. And he started talking. He said to me that we are very different from these people. We, if something small happens to our kid, we will go crazy. You know, like even something slight on her eyebrow or something. But these people, Ukrainians, they don't care so much. Their child is going to die. Who cares? I'm like, fuck. I guess he's right, you know, <laughs> like, I guess he's right, you know. And he was having the same conflict with his wife that I was having with my ex-wife. So, and I come to terms, you know, like, okay, she's going to act like this. She will not really care. She doesn't, really, because I don't know how to describe it, but for Ukrainians, human life is not as worthy as Turks uh, or, human or life. Western people. It's human interesting. Life. Like, for example, Russia is worse. There are uh, so many Russian soldiers butchered. Do you know how many Russian soldiers died in this war? I, I don't know. On close to 200,000 probably at the moment. We're going to be 200,000. And who is revolting in Russia? Not much. Nobody. Yeah, it's a very... It's, I mean, I have compassion for Russian people too because... They are the real losers of this war. I mean, Ukrainians too, of course, and they are more on the innocent part. But so back to the story, I'm like, okay, so we are going, come and see your daughter and we say goodbye. And she comes in and she's like, don't want to let go of her child. You know, like, oh, I didn't want to mean that. Please stay. And then I got really my, um, how do you call it? Like this reptilian brain is awakened, you know, like, it's a survival mode, right? I yes. have, we have this war. I have my child and I cannot take my child out of this country. <laughs> so it was a lot of conflict, you know, like I, I kind of kidnapped the kids, you know, like, and just, you know, I was panicked that this is going to be the end of us. Good. This whole psychological problems. Because it could be. In, in, intermarriage war will result in a way that by the time we decide how to get out of this country, the Russians will invade, and it could yes. have happened. Luckily, it yes. didn't happen because the Russians were very bad with war. Actually, I think it's obvious that, you know, like they've messed up in a big way, strategically, logistically. It's very stupid and very sad, actually, what is happening. It's totally useless and doesn't have to be like this. But I guess... The Russians and Ukrainians, they both need, we all as, as whole humanity, we have learned to lessons to learn from this, you know? Yeah. I, I could put, so then I could put a lot of responsibility on Ukrainians actually. Look, really the Soviet Union, the, the communist regime collapsed what? 1991, 1992. Yeah. So all these Eastern Bloc countries, you look at them, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, Romania. They came to a certain point. Most of them are 
European Union countries, they evolved, they developed their countries, their economy much got much better, they westernized, they, they're capitalistic, they know how to survive in the modern world. But Ukraine, they did nothing. It's a very corrupted and very backward mentality country. They didn't uh -huh. change an inch since 1991. They stayed Soviet. They stayed Soviet. Yes. Okay, okay, and yeah. if they would do what the Poland have done, they wouldn't be invaded so easily. Russia wouldn't take what Russia would take them seriously, right? So now they have to start their journey of like they were like a little kid or a teenager as a nation. And now they have to grow up and grow up very quickly to become an adult and protect themselves, which is good for them. But unfortunately, the lesson is painful. Well, so then I see. So then after you escaped and yeah. took your daughter, you went to Romania. Yeah, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, Overland. Really? Bulgaria too. And how was that experience, man? Like it was just you and, 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 and your daughter or then uh, your ex-wife also I mean, came and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. With three of us, we traveled. That was the easy part. You know, like okay. the war is behind you. Fun stuff. People okay. want to... Yeah, people want to help you so much. The Romanians were sure. amazing, you know, like... Um, so... I'm back to my country in my comfort space, you know, like... You've been in Turkey for it, a while, Fatina? I mean, since the war, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And now, in present day, I know you're, um, you're, you have clients, you're doing, you know, tantra teaching, and you're my first tantra teacher, so um, you helped me a lot. As you know, you gave me all the practices, the techniques, and, um, and I actually did them. You know, not just kind of like, listen, but I did all of them. And, and I'll tell you one thing. This is something that I've learned, uh, perhaps on my own, that nobody ever told me before. I, I had an intuition, like in the Vegas days, I had like some kind of intuition about it, but I wasn't sure of it. So here's the secret that I learned that nobody taught me. I believe that... Performance in the bedroom, the most important thing, and again, it's just me, is not like uh, how good my blood flow is, even though obviously all these things are important, but I'm saying what's the most important? Blood flow is there, testosterone levels, dopamine levels, right? Fitness, like energy, fitness, blah, blah, blah. There's all this stuff, right? being in the moment, I think there's one factor that's more important than all of them. You know what that is? Love. Yeah, I would say. The girl. The girl. And it's the connection. The connection. Right? There is a certain level of connection in which you let go of all the past. It's gone. And it's just you and her. That's it. Connected on a level that doesn't exist any other way. So that... It doesn't exist any other time. You know, like time is slowing down. It doesn't, like the it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And that, I would say, because I'm also very conscious when I'm in that situation, you know, because I, I, I want to... Uh, you know, retain my, my, my sperm, not ejaculate. And one thing that has happened to me, Fatih, and you'll appreciate this, this happened many times. And I, again, this just happened. It wasn't like I practiced it or I learned it. It just happened. And that is, I will get contraction in my penis. So it'll like, you know, ejaculate. Like it, it'll, 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 it'll contract, but nothing comes out. It just contracts. So this she can feel it. Already. Yeah. Oh yeah. Many times. Okay. So, okay. It, it, and, 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 and it never happened to me before. And I didn't like learn it or practice it or read about it or watch a video. None of that. It just happened. And I was like, wow, this is maybe this is what they call like a dry, dry orgasm or whatever. Right. And, and, uh, I'm not doing any of the Mantak Chia, you know, multiple orgasming. I'm not doing any of it. I'm just like living, right. Just being. And I, you know, I get these movements and nothing comes out 
and I'm retaining it and, uh, and, and, and I can go on and I can just keep going. And so, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Like I can slow down, I can become faster, I can stop. There's a lot of cool stuff that I think it's just the connection. It's just love. It's like, it's like a ninja level of control that I could never even imagine in my dreams. Yeah. I'm very happy and proud of you. I'm very happy for you and proud of you. Well, the connection is very important because like, this is also something that I really, lately discovered or rediscovered is in lovemaking, relaxation is very essential. And to be able to relax fully, you need to be able to trust your partner fully um, or as much as possible. That's huge. So, yeah. So in Tantra, actually, with monogamous relationships, you can go very, very deep. And this, we know stories from the uh, tradition, from Tibetan legends, for example. Partners, tantric partners, who are going on together with only with themselves for long years, they can reach crazy states of enlightenment, crazy states of consciousness. So it works, and I'm happy for you. And also, uh, thank you, man. Like really, um, the the moment I met you, uh, you know, reading your book, being one of the first people to read it. And also, um, you, you know, right? You showed me the Pilates exercises at my place in Kiev. I remember <laughs> um, doing that so often, and and learning blood flow stuff from you, and uh, you know, the, the the concept of the internal abs, not just the external, but what the internal muscles and how important th those are, and the pelvic floor stuff, and um, the whole journey of masculinity, and um, Tantra is, uh, is, is, is such a blessing, man, such a blessing. And I do want to say that the work that you're doing is very important, is very important. The, the work that allow, and also, man, you being, uh, you know, Turkish, you, you coming from a, like a, a very Islamic place, but it's also secular, right? And it's successful country and it's, uh, a very immense culture and history, right? With the Ottoman Empire, like it's it's just awesome. Uh, and and then the the famous drama that everyone watches all over the world that you guys make, so, which I haven't seen yeah. yet. But like coming from this logical, rational culture, but also being so experimental, being so open, right? Exploring the Mayan calendar. You know, exploring Tantra, going to Thailand for four years, just or four and a half years, as long as you were there and, and, and living with strangers in the beginning and, 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 and just experiencing what life has to offer. Right. And I will tell you through ups and downs. And I met you, you, you brought your daughter. I remember when we met in Kiev and she was playing with us and I can tell you that no matter what has happened in your life and in your relationship, I know that you're a caring person. I know this because I've met Thank you, you I've seen you. And the, the pain and empathy and care that you have in your heart, very few people have. So consider yourself, I consider myself lucky to, to know you and to learn from you, man. Like I, I, I was looking so forward to this having this with you because we can uncover so much together because we've known each other for so many years. Yeah. And in and this conversation for me as well, and in this conversation, so many different dimensions opened up, you know, like I think yes. you're a great podcast host because the way you hold the space, the way you hold the conversation is, um, doing two things on me. One of them is I have to be absolutely my highest self, my true self so i can be very intimate you know like sharing things that i don't i wouldn't imagine sharing on a podcast and secondly sure. it's like me st stimulating my brain to think in a creative way and bring all the information that i had and offer what is relevant in that moment so this is all because of you holding the space so i would like to 
come back. Hundred <laughs> percent, man. I, I, yeah. it would be my pleasure, and uh, definitely a round two coming. And I'm sure more than it is a pleasure for both of us, it's a pleasure to for all the people that get knowledge from this and can really improve their life, right? And and nowadays, uh, your coaching, you know, one on one coaching is what you love the most. That's how you coached me. Um, and, and, and so if someone wants to reach out to you, I'll just, you know, write down your, your website or your, your Instagram and, and they'll just reach out and, uh, you know, yeah, excellent. Uh, they'll be lucky. They'll be lucky if, if you accept them. All right, bro. Thanks so yeah, much man. for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Fatih. Thank you, brother. Love you, man. I love you too.